everyone, including those who are in Shire Hall, to mute your mics and turn off your camera unless you are speaking. Those who are in the committee room, their cameras will be on all of the time, but their microphones will be off until they're speaking. So colleagues in the room, please remember to click your mic on. OK, before we get into the formal business of the meeting, can I just say how the voting is going to work? Because of the numbers on the call, what I'm going to do when it comes to each of the votes, I'm going to ask for those voting against to raise their hands using the hands raised feature on the bar on your screen. So it will be those voting against, followed by abstentions. If you're abstaining at that point, you will need to raise your hand. And that way, we'll be able to assume that anyone either not voting against or abstaining is voting for the motion. OK, I hope that's clear. Monica, uh, Councillor Sargent, um, I can't, uh, there's no hand facility on my uh, pro. So. OK, if there's no hand facility, then please indicate in the chat box at that point whether you are voting against, I'll take it steady, or abstaining. Ideally, put your hands up for one or the other of those. If you don't have the hands up facility, please indicate in the chat box and we'll keep an eye on that. OK, so once again, everyone, if you're not in Shire Hall, cameras off and mics off. And those in Shire Hall, mics off until you're speaking. OK, at that point, we're going to go over to the formal business and open the meeting. So we'll move on to the election of chair. Councillor Davis. Good morning, everyone. And it's very nice for us all to be together again as a, a collective council. And welcome to the first digital meeting of Warwickshire County Council. With this being the AGM, our first job is to elect a new chair for the forthcoming year. So could I ask for nominations, please? Councillor Second. May I speak now or shall I come back, Chair? Um, I would very much like to nominate Alan Coburn, who I have known for rather frighteningly about 30 years, I suspect. Um, but um, that is in a social way uh, as, as well as a, um, as a councillor. He has really given great service to Warwickshire County Council. But before that, I want to just emphasise the... Um, the, the essence of a Warwickshire farming family. Um, Alan was born on a farm in Covington and in, when he was four, he moved to Park Farm Warwick and he lived there until he, in 1975, he moved to Fernhill Farm in Kenilworth where he is now. Um, he moved there two years before he got married, I think that's right, and he married Gillian uh, in 1977. This was a very auspicious year, you might remember. Um, it was the Silver Jubilee year, so much to commend it. And uh, he brought up a family with three girls in, in Fernhill Farm. He became a councillor first in 1999, but joined Warwickshire County Council in 2001, actually the same year that I did. Uh, so we have been on our journey together. He has held many roles in, in, in Warwickshire, including being portfolio holder uh, and being deputy leader. Uh, there are too many to mention, but he has at his heart Warwickshire and also Warwickshire County Council. So I commend Alan Coburn as chairman for the next year. And may I also thank you, Chair, for all you have done over the last year. It's been an unusual year, I think you will admit. Um, possibly hasn't ended in quite the same way that you would have liked, or indeed that we would all have liked. But I have to commend you for having done a wonderful job for Warwickshire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Izzy. Can I ask for a second, please? Councillor Butlin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's my absolute delight to uh, second Alan as Chairman of the uh, Council. 
It's an unfortunate year because he won't get to the usual aplomb that goes with kind of being chair uh, due to the COVID stuff. But Alan and me go a long way back. We're both from farming families and uh, our paths have crossed, crisscrossed on many occasions over the over the years, starting with young farmers. And uh, we uh, engaged in debating uh, uh, competitions and quizzes and all sorts of things, as well as the rallies when we was uh, young farmers. And... Uh, uh, healthy competition. And I think both of us learnt uh, how to debate uh, during those years in the young farmers, and uh, that's uh, why we've got to, we're, we're ended up where we are. Um, Alan came into the council a few years before me, and we seem to have uh, kind of followed each other around the council. Um, he was uh, transport, and then I followed into transport, and then he was resources, and I followed into resources. He was deputy leader, and I followed him there as well. But uh, uh, Alan always kind of uh, does conducts his business with a big smile on his face. Uh, he's known for his big smile, and um, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, and confident that he will do a grand job as chairman of uh, Warwickshire County Council and be a great ambassador for us going forward, despite the difficult times that we're in. Thanks. Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Peter. Now, as is the formal requirement, I must just ask: Are there any other nominations? No, nope, lovely. Therefore, we, we move on to a vote. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Monica to take us through that process. Councillors, are there any votes against? Any abstentions? That's an abstention from Councillor Condacore. and councillor chilvers so i can assume then that the other votes the other councillors are in support so that is carried we'll now hand over the chain to councillor coburn Thank you very much, councillors. I'd like to congratulate the new chair and now it's your turn to sign the declaration. Okay, right. Um, thank you, Nicola. Thank you for all your help. Can I first of all thank my two sponsors uh, for their kind words? and my fellow councillors for their support. Uh, I will do my, do my utmost to follow in the proud tradition, tradition of past chairman, uh, who without exception have held this uh, post as the council's civic head with dignity and chaired the meetings in a non-partisan and even-handed way as exemplified by Nicola. I'm also really looking forward to uh, this coming year as Warwickshire is a county which is very close to my heart. My family has farmed in this part of the world since my great grandfather came down here to rent one of the Earl of Warwick's farms from Cumbria in 1888. So I appreciate what a really special place Warwickshire is. It has one of the fastest growing economies in the country with brilliant transport links being at the crossroads of England. And uh, with its stunning countryside and small towns and villages, it's a great place to live. So I feel really fortunate to be here. Now, when I was elected as vice chairman last year, nobody could have predicted the situation we find ourselves in today. The coronavirus has caused great suffering and hardship, but it's also brought out the best in people. Apart from the heroic actions of the NHS frontline in protecting us, people in all walks of life have turned to their neighbours and communities to ask how they can help help others in any way. Support groups have started up to deliver, to deliver medicines, shop for essentials, and just to chat to residents who are most at risk. 
In my hometown of Kenilworth, volunteers have delivered over 40,000 40, prescriptions to people's homes. They call themselves the Farmy Army. Um, but everyone at this council, from the chief executive downwards, have had to find new ways of working literally overnight, with 4,500 working from home. They have adopted, adapted to new roles on how to deliver the services to our most vulnerable residents, those in adult social care, to vulnerable children, and to thousands who are shielding. They deserve great credit for the way that they have knuckled down and gone with a job in hand with a minimum of fuss, and I, I uh, give them my thanks. Nobody knows how this pandemic will end, but I believe that if we continue to work together and support each other, we will defeat it. This coming year uh, will not be like one that I envisaged, but on a positive note, missing out on all those buffets will do my waistline no harm at all. I'd now like to uh, propose a, a motion of thanks to the retiring chairman. And um, do I have a seconder? <clears throat> yes, I, I'm, I will second the vote of thanks to the yes, Councillor Sarah Bowe, thank you. So I, I'll, I'll start off. It gives, me, it gives me great pleasure to vote to propose a vote of thanks to the immediate past chairman, Councillor Nicola Davis. I've enjoyed working with Nicola uh, in over the past year, and I haven't failed to be impressed by her enthusiasm for the role. She's always conducted herself in a professional but good-natured way, and always with a smile. So thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, you've done a great job, and I'll do my best to copy it. So uh, I will go over to Councillor Sarah Bode, who's going to second that proposition. Sarah. Thank you, Chair. And can I congratulate you on your on taking office in these rather unusual circumstances? I was thinking, aren't we lucky to have a chain that's so easy to put on? Um, in that you can just <laughs> pop it over your head and there it is sitting perfectly. Um, I wanted to, to pay tribute to, to Nicola's year as, as chair of the council. It has had a rather abrupt end um, and I, I do feel for, for Nicola and all the other uh, chairs and mayors throughout the country who have also seen their, their uh, terms of office end in a rather abrupt way. Um, but there are ways of doing things and I'm sure you will find that chair uh, ways of doing things uh, I think Nicola's been an exemplary ambassador for Warwickshire, whether she's been attending concerts uh, with, uh, with, the, with the Warwickshire Choristers or uh, fire awards or representing the county in all sorts of different ways. When we've had members of, of the royal family visiting the county, she's done so in an absolutely exemplary fashion. Um, and I know that um, she's been supported very, very well by her family. Um, and she's had a, a, a splendid year, say, albeit ending in a rather abrupt way. Um, and I'm sure the experience of, of being chair of the council uh, will live with her um, as, as a very positive thing to have done um, for, for, for years to come. So thank you very much, Nicola. Well done for an excellent year and enjoy your year in office. Councillor Coburn, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, now I'd like to... Um, well, I would present a badge to the uh, <laughs> retiring chairman, but she can't catch very well, so I think you have to sort of assume that she's going to have that. And I'd like to ask uh, Nicola to respond to the uh, vote of thanks. Nicola. Well, thank you very much for your kind word, words, Alan and Sarah. And let me be one of the first as well to congratulate you on becoming chair. I know you'll do a, a, a brilliant job this year. Um, it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to serve as your chair for the past year and the unanticipated extra few months. And during that time, I attended 100 events and was constantly reminded of the close bonds both within and between our communities across Warwickshire and with our neighbours in Solihull and Coventry. At the Long Service Awards, I had the chance to talk to some of our longest serving members of staff and hear of their commitment to public service, which, like the writing in a stick of rock, runs right through the County Council, Public Health and our Fire and Rescue Service. Don't panic, I'm not going to regale you with a year's worth of anecdotes, but we'll simply say that each event was unique and showcased the best of the county and was a pleasure to attend. I'd like to just pay a personal tribute at this point to councillor, former Councillor Bernard Curtin and our colleagues Bill Olner and Richard Chatterway. I represented us as councillors as best I could within the restrictions at each of their funerals and they each held the community very close to their hearts and were powerful advocates for their beliefs and will be very much missed by us as a county. 
A few personal thank yous to Dawn Mardle for her incomparable organisational skills, Stuart and Roger for their impeccable timekeeping and chauffeuring, Simon Bode and Yana De Silva for their willingness and flexibility in helping with childcare, so much so that my boys were delighted every time I went out, and to Monica, Sarah and Nicola for their advice and invaluable guidance during these meetings, and for Democratic Services for their consistent attention to detail and support. And of course, my husband, Simon, who sometimes had to finish a night shift, pull on a suit and come out and do quite unusual things like meet Princess Anne, which he, he did join me in doing very well. <laughs> now, at school, I was torn between wanting to be a jump jockey, quite a high risk endeavour with a lot of chances to fall, and a librarian, a rather calm and methodical occupation. And at times during this year and these meetings, a strange combination of both have, have felt sort of part of my reality. Uh, my aim has been to make sure that all members' voices have been heard and valued, and I hope that the public has seen decisions being made in a fair and transparent way. So throughout the last year, I've sought to follow advice from George Eliot, who said, wear a smile and have friends, wear a scowl and have wrinkles. And I have smiled a lot this year, and I felt great friendship from all corners of the county. And I thank my fellow members here, and also the fellow civic heads across the county for their warm hospitality, their great company and lovely memories. And I'm sure that warm hospitality will be being extended in the familiar ways, hopefully in as short a time as possible. So on that note, I say a final thank you. And Alan, the reins are firmly handed over to you. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, we now come to the election of vice chair, uh, and I'd like to ask for nominations, please. Do I have any nominations for vice chairman? Councillor Seb Grant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it is my pleasure to nominate uh, Councillor Pete Gilbert. What can I say about Pete, really? Uh, seriously, I don't actually know what I'm allowed to say about Pete in public. Uh, he's a larger-than-life character, both literally and figuratively speaking. Uh, Pete's well-established and respected in his community in Bulkington, maintaining the fine family tradition of running the Weaver's Arms pub in Bulkington Village, boosting our spirits all through lockdown with his comedy skits on Facebook, where Pete dabbled in socially distanced karaoke and trialling an innovative drive through pub system. Pete has also served as Borough Councillor for Attleborough Ward in Nuneaton and Bedworth, having served a year as leader of Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council, during which he was a fierce proponent and supporter of local fire services and promoter of businesses in the borough during a time of recession. Most recently, Pete was elected to serve the communities of Bedworth Heath, Ash Green and Kersley Village on Warwickshire County Council, in fact, I'll never forget the gasps in the hall on the night when that shocking at the time result was declared. Mostly from our own Conservatives, actually. <laughs> Suffice to say that Pete rose to the occasion well, though, reaching out to his constituents in a diverse community that had not been represented by a Conservative before. His residents now know him as an assiduous caseworker with a strong work ethic and plenty of time to help with local causes who enjoys lengthy conversations on the doorstep whether people ask for them or not. He also <laughs> enjoys politics reorganising his patch very much and never moans at all. I promised myself I'd be an honest politician, but I guess that's out the window now. Uh, Pete is also a large supporter of local charities in Bedworth. He keeps it quiet because that's where he likes to help. It's easy to help others in a way that boosts your own ego and reputation, but Pete doesn't do that. Pete helps those who are the most vulnerable in our community because it's the right thing to do not for acknowledgements. Keeping all of the above in mind, and keeping in mind that this is a man who self-describes himself as miserable, cantankerous, objectionable, hostile, manic and deluded, those being his good points, I would like to nominate um, Councillor Gilbert as the next Deputy Chair of Warwickshire County Council, and seeing him up there next to the Chair, making all our meetings all the more livelier, will lift our spirits during such a difficult time as he has done for so many people in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Grant. Do I have a seconder? Councillor uh, yes. Yusuf Daymarsh. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and I'm delighted to second Councillor Pete Gilbert's nomination for the Vice Chair of the Council. But before turning to his many qualities and suitability for the role, can I first congratulate you on your ascension to the Chair and wish you well for the year ahead. Thank you. I also congratulate Councillor Davies on her year in the Chair. 
during that time she marshaled us all magnificently and did the county proud at all times. Um, my colleague Councillor Graham has just spoken with typical insight, grace and good humour about Councillor Gilbert's qualities which is no mean feat and that's not because he isn't imbued with many admirable qualities or the requisite and quintessential skills required of Vice Chair. It is simply because there isn't a great deal that any of us can say about Pete that he hasn't at some stage already said about himself in even more glowing terms. As you would have noted, and as Councillor Graham just said, since his election to the Council in 2017, Pete enjoys speaking. In fact, he enjoys it quite a lot. But when he does, you cannot dispute his energy, his conviction, his passion for standing up for the residents of his own division in Bedworth and for all of Warwickshire, and indeed for the work of this Council. Now, some of you may know that Pete has a great affection for Churchill and the great man, Winston, that is, once said, if you have an important point to make, don't try to be subtle or clever. Use a pile driver, hit the point once and then come back and hit it again. Then hit it a third time and give it a tremendous whack. These are certainly words that Pete has taken to heart and he lives by. And it's because of that that his contributions as a member of this council are so valuable. And whilst it might be true to say that members on the opposite benches may, on occasion, disagree with what he says, I'm sure that even they will admit it's hard not to admire the force with which he says it. So, Mr Chairman, because a Vice Chair needs to be armed and ready at all times to step in and represent the Council should the Chair be unavailable, I can think of no one more suitable. He has a proven dedication to the County over many years in a number of public roles, so I'm very pleased to second Councillor Gilbert's nomination for Vice Chair of this Council. And I'm sure all members will join me in wishing you the very, very best of luck, as not only do you need to sit next to him for a year, you'll also have to try and keep him on a leash. I'll formally second the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Daymarsh. Um, do I have any other nominations for Vice Chair? No? Well, in that case, I'd like to ask uh, Monica, Monica Fogarty, the Chief Executive, again to take control of the voting. Monica. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask those councillors who are against the election of Councillor Gilbert as Vice Chair to indicate now by raising their hands? Can I move to any abstentions to please raise their hands? I have two abstentions, in which case I can assume that the remaining councillors are voting for Councillor Gilbert as vice chair. We now hand over the chain. Can I be the first to congratulate you, Councillor Gilbert, on your uh, achieving the role of Vice Chairman and um, I'll uh, ask you to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'll start by congratulating you on your appointment and associate myself with the words that you made about the outgoing Chairman. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I will be brief, as I promised in previous meetings, and I would like to say a thank you to my proposer and seconder. You were both witty, you were both interesting and you were both accurate. So it does prove that you both have speech writers. Um, but thank you for your comments. And uh, I will look forward to uh, supporting you, Mr. Chairman, in whatever capacity you see fit. It is a proud honour to be your chairman and also uh, vice chairman and the vice chairman of this county. So I look forward to the interesting months ahead in the chamber. And I promise that I will be on my leash at all times. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. That was brief, and there's always a first time. <laughs> right, we're now moving on to uh, uh, the meeting, and uh, we'll start off with apologies for absence. At the moment, I have uh, four uh, councillors who've told me about this. One is uh, Councillor John Cook, who is on jury service, uh, Councillor Anne Parry, Councillor Dave Riley, and Councillor Jeff Clark. Are there any other apologies? No, well in that case, uh, we'll move on to dispensations. Uh, I don't know of any. Then we've got members of dis uh, disclosure of pecuniary and non-pecuniary interests. Do I have any councillors who've got any? No? Well, in that case, we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting on the 18th of February. 
uh, to confirm the accuracy of the minutes and also matters arising. Are there any matters arising from these minutes? No, well, in that case, uh, I, will, I presume, unless I hear otherwise, that everyone is happy to have that accepted, the, the minutes uh, passed. And so I'll move on to item number four, which is announcements, to announce the deaths of four county councillors since the last uh, meeting, which is very sad indeed. And there's four really sort of uh, uh, experienced and uh, valued members that have, been, have, been, have served on this council. And um, we'd like to, I'd like to start off by uh, talking about the councillor Stanley Birch, who uh, passed away recently. I didn't actually know Stanley. He was a county councillor between, uh, uh, I think it was 1970 and 1993. Uh, and although I didn't know him, uh, councillor John Cook, who was one of the first, or one of the few members that served with him, uh, has written a, uh, a, a few words. I knew of Stanley Birch. He was very well known, but I don't think I ever knew him personally. So I'll read his statement. Uh, Stanley Birch was elected to the Leamington Borough Council in 1964, serving there uh, for 10 years, and he was mayor of Leamington in 1971 to 1972. While serving on the Borough Council, he was elected to Warwickshire County Council in 1970, where he served until 1993, and he had the honour of being chairman from 1989 to 1990. Uh, as chairman, he and his wife Monica held the last grand ball to be held in the great hall in Old Shire Hall, and a memorable occasion for all those attended. Uh, importantly, Stanley was chairman of the Police Authority from 1973 to 87, an appointment of which he was very proud, and um, I believe is a record term of office. He often appeared in Leamington, Leamington Spa Courier wearing his bowler hat and shaking hands with the new recruits as they passed in the Wrighton Police Training College. So next, Stanley was elected. So next, Stanley was elected to the brand new Warwick District Council in 1973, and he served there till 1995, and held the office of chairman in the year 1881. Now I must now, well, I must concentrate on the very important part of Stanley's career in local service. Between 1971 and 1974, he chaired the South Warwickshire Hospital Group Management Committee, which was held in the Warnford, Warwick, Heathcote and Central Hospital Hatton and at N. Badger Hospital at Shipton on Stour. This then led Stanley to the appointment by the Secretary of State for Health as Chairman of the Warwickshire Area Health Authority between 1973 and 1982. And following the reorganisation of health authorities in 1982, he was again appointed by the Secretary of State as South Warwickshire Health Authority Chairman, a position he held until 1986. Uh, Stanley took all these health, or, uh, health authority appointments very seriously, and he was often seen visiting wards in all the hospitals in his charge. If this was not enough, Stanley was an extremely caring person and founded the first women's refuge in Warwickshire. He was also the first chairman of Warwick District Committee for the Disabled and the first chairman of Warwick District Council for voluntary, for voluntary service, of which he took a very active part. He was also the first president of the very successful Leamington International Friendship Society, which led to the formal twinning between Leamington and the several European towns, uh, yeah, that I can't pronounce. Uh, Stanley Birch was a class act uh, who generally succeeded in making Leamington Spa, Warwick District and the county a better place to live. He was a giant among, amongst local politicians in Warwickshire and had a ma magnificent record in his community and he will really be sorely missed. The second sad council uh, uh, that's passed away uh, was Stanley, was Bernard Curtin. Sorry, Bernard Curtin was, uh, a, he was a giant amongst local councillors. I've known of Bernard before, I be, he was well known by me before I became a councillor because he was uh, a very well respected councillor. And I've got, would like to start off by asking uh, councillor Ju Judy Falk to say a few words about him. Judy. Thank you and, and congratulations Chairman on your appointment. Um, 
I sat down to think and, and type out what uh, I could say, this dedication to Bernard. Uh, where did I start? Um, what words could I use to speak about the man I'd known for, uh, for over 25 years? Um, he was a mentor and a friend to me. Uh, he was a fellow town and district councillor in the party, the Witness Residents Association that he set up with friends. Um, he took a village and he created a town uh, and he became that town's first mayor. Um, he was determined and forward thinking, stubborn and very hard working and would not take no for an answer. He helped so many people, sometimes quietly, with no fuss, um, and occasionally you'd find out about that. Somebody would say, oh, yes, Bernard's helped, Bernard's helped me, but often with newspaper headlines. Um, his contact book was amazing. I did ask him if I could have it, but he wouldn't let me have it. Um, he rang Richard Branson's PA to complain that his wife had received terrible treatment on one of the Virgin trains. Um, he contacted, in America, the boss of a firm trying to put electric, electric terminal towers in Whitnash. Uh, there are no terminal towers in Whitnash now. Um, he was known as the Whitnash Rottweiler, uh, and I don't know how many of you are aware of, of how he got that title. Um, he loved telling the story. Uh, he, he'd rung up to speak to a county officer, um, and the person on the end of the phone, as people often don't realise, you can actually still be heard. Um, <laughs> And he shouted across the office, uh, is that Rottweiler from Whitnash? Um, and when the officer um, that Bernard had wanted to speak to came on the phone, he just said, woof, woof. <laughs> he was hilarious. Um, needless to say, he did get his, uh, his issue sorted. Um, I could go on for a long, long time. Bernard's done everything, I think virtually every role, both at district, town and, and county. But I know others will speak of, of him as well. Um, all I can say, it was a sad end to his life uh, that he passed away with COVID um, without people surrounding him. Well, we will have a memorial for him in Whitnash as soon as we're able. Um, he spent his life helping others and he dedicated his life to public speaking and he'll certainly never be forgotten in Whitnash and beyond. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Falp. Uh, I'd now like to bring in Councillor Jerry Roodhouse. And I think Jerry wanted to say a few words about it's Dundee Birch as well, but I'm afraid I, I missed that. So, Jerry, over to you. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. C congratulations to you and Pete. Um, I hope you do keep Pete in control. Um, but there we go. Um, yeah, on Stanley Birch, I think Sarah Bode knew Stanley as well and wanted to say a few words as well at some stage. And I was fortunate, I didn't serve with Stanley, but as I was coming into the County Council, uh, I met him a few times when he was chairing the Police Authority. And he was, as you say, a stalwart in the local community in what he did. His reputation literally did follow um, the actions that were taking place. And, um, you know, he's he, he somebody that stood up for his community and stood up for the area that, that he did. Um, the way they, they, he operated with the police committee and things um, in the good old days when local authorities uh, had police committees, he certainly led that way forward. Um, turning to, to Bernard, um, I have fond memories of Bernard um, through the time on the County Council and um, one that sticks in my mind, which sort of uh, brings together what Judy was talking about as well, was when Warwickshire was under Labour control with Ian Bottrell and others um, at that time. They only needed one vote to, to get budgets through and things. So... Um, as it was, there we were sort of 12 hours into a debate and uh, Bernard was sort of hurried off to a room somewhere by Ian Bottrell and others and long discussions took place. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, the budget went through and Bernard supported it, but Whitnash was the better for it because it had suddenly got new traffic lights, extra highway improvements and uh, quite a few other things uh, that were going on as well uh, coming into Whitnash. And I think it just clearly demonstrated to me that the passion that Bernard had for his area, uh, as Judy said, the Rottweiler, he, he stood up for Whitnash. He was the person for Whitnash. And, you know, everybody knew that. And it, you couldn't cross him if you if you wanted to do something. He'd make sure that the community of Whitnash uh, actually had uh, what it needed. And that was everybody. It didn't matter uh, where they lived within that community. So he had a passion uh, for, for his area and a community spirit, uh, which uh, was a really good example to me as a fairly young councillor at the time when I arrived at the County Council. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, on my list, list I have uh, Councillor Parminder Singh Birdy, who would like to say a few words. Parminder. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, congratulations on your appointment. I'm sure you will do a good job this coming year. Uh, Bernard, I'd like to say a few words about Bernard Curtin, please. He was a much loved family man, resident, uh, councillor, and pillar of the community in Witness Town. Uh, every morning, he would habitually, eight o'clock, he will walk up to the news agents, pick up his daily papers, and on this one Friday, unluckily for me, he picked up the Lemon Spark Courier. And the front page said that I was coming off the uh, after my term of chairman of chamber of trade, and by about uh, twenty past eight he was knocking on my door. And against my better judgment, by quarter past nine I was member of a witness resident association, and he had persuaded me to stand uh, as an independent councillor in witness. Um, and rest, as you might say, is history. So I'm here today because. Bernard knocked on my day that morning. I had no intention of coming into local government, but you know that's how things happen sometimes. Uh, Bernard had a unique skill of not only saying the right thing at the right time, but also remembering the right key facts at the right time. He was a fantastic local councillor and served his ward and county council extremely well. Um, you know, I remember him. I will remember him always. Um, uh, he did a lot for his uh, ward and residents. He was given many names by his opponents, but I would like to remember him as King of Witness, as he was locally known. So, Bernard King of Witness, we will remember you. Thank you for what all you did for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Um Did I believe that Sarah Bode wanted to say a few words as well? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, Stanley Birch left um, the County Council, I think, before any of us uh, got elected. He, he left in 93. Um, I came on in, uh, in a by-election in 1994. But I did know him very well uh, in his role as a district councillor and also as a charter trustee. I got elected to Warwick District Council in 1987 um, and Stanley, of course, was a member there. And I now represent um, on the County Council the area that he represented, uh, the Old Manor uh, Division. Uh, Stanley was a stalwart of local government, as you say. When you were reading out his um, the CV and the, and the tribute to him, I'd forgotten some of the things that he actually did uh, around the police authority and health. And he was certainly very, very passionate about health and also about uh, the, the refuge. I knew that was something that was very, very close to his heart. So he was a very good servant um, to, to Leamington and to Warwickshire and, and to Warwick District over many, many years. And I know he will be sadly missed um, within Leamington. Could I also just say a brief word about Bernard as well? Um, I got elected to Warwick District Council in 1987 and uh, had the joy of sitting next to Bernard in both uh, policy and resources and development services um, on the county. And I was on the, on the district council, I used to sit next to him. And I have to say, he, would, he, he joked in t completely through the meeting. He would crack jokes at which I would uh, have to laugh politely, whether, they were, whether I found them funny or not. Um, but he, he was always very, very good company. The other thing I remember about Bernard, he was a great adopter of new technology. So he probably had one of the first fax machines um, in the county. And he used to fax a lot to start with. And then, of course, he got a mobile phone. Um, again, when mobile phones were very, very new. And I'm told he would come across a pothole and immediately ring up whichever county council officer it was um, that was responsible for said hole um, and demand that it be fixed straight away. I was told that there was an instruction that he was not to be phoned back on his mobile phone because it cost too much money in those days to ring, to ring a mobile phone. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but Bernard was a tremendous supporter of Whitnash uh, and he really, really, I think, probably uh, managed to get for Whitnash. Um, he, you know, he punched far above his weight in getting, in getting really good things for Whitnash. And I'm sure that I know the residents of Whitnash will miss him um, greatly, as will we all. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Is there anybody else who'd like to say a few words about Councillor Curtin? Councillor Chilvers, you'd like to say a few words, yes. Councillor Chilvers. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, and welcome to your role. Um, 
Yes, so I represent the neighbouring constituency to, to Bernard in South Leamington. And as I was becoming a councillor um, seven or eight years ago, um, he was the role model about um, how to stand up for your local area. Um, and he was able to give me um, a number of hints about uh, um, being vociferous in standing up for uh, our own local neighbourhood. Uh, and so I kind of always looked up to him um, in that uh, role. And so I just want to say thank you very much, Bernard, and uh, you will be missed. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Councillor John Holland. John. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I'd just like to echo those comments because during my time on Warwick District Council, Bernard was incredibly helpful. Uh, he really was. Uh, very fiercely independent of um, mainstream political parties, but without um, appearing to be helpful, he was helpful. And he always tried to find out what people were trying to achieve and then put them, point them in the direction uh, to get there. And uh, it's interesting that his daughter Fiona has now been on national media, and you can tell she's her father's daughter, and of course she wants us to learn lessons so that if, if we have another increase in infection, that we are, are prepared for it. And I could just I always remember Bernard saying that uh, he left the Labour Party to avoid being expelled, and it wasn't like that at all. His heart was always in his community and helping everybody, whoever they were. Thank you, John. Uh, next I have Councillor Neil Durbix. Neil. Thank you, Alan, um, and congratulations on your, your appointment. Um, for most of my life, I've been uninterested in politics and not really followed it but all of my um, uh, life really I have been aware of Bernard. I first came uh, across him um, when I was at school when I was about 10, sort of 52 years ago and he has cropped up regularly ever since even though i've not really been following the, the the political arguments and he's all through that time represented somebody who always spoke up for people in his community um and he he has led by example to all of us and i i would thank him for that again if i could I certainly did when I became a county councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. So uh, the, the, now the next person uh, who we want to pay, pay tribute to is Bill Olner, and I would ask Councillor Helen Adkins to start. Helen. Thank you, Chair. And um, can I just pass on my congratulations to to you and Councillor Gilbert for your appointments and to thank Councillor Nicola Davis for her time as chair. She did a great job. Um, can I also pass on my condolences to the friends and family of um, Stanley Birch and Bernard Kirsten, although I didn't know them myself. Um, I know that they were dedicated warriors for the people of, of Warwickshire. Um, the loss of Bill is not just a blow to the Labour group, but to, to all members and officers in the county. I know he'll be missed by the many friends he had on all sides of the chamber, as well as by the officers he worked with and developed friendships with. Not only was Bill an invaluable member of Warwickshire County Council, he was a political giant in Warwickshire. It was not until he passed that I had a real picture of how respected and appreciated he was for his many years of service to the people of Nuneaton and Bedworth. What struck me was his tireless dedication, not to his own success, but in fighting for the most vulnerable residents in his, co in his communities throughout Warwickshire. Bill was a formidable politician, always on the ball, making knowledgeable and focused contributions at committee meetings and full council debates. He was also a warm and lovely person who was fascinating to talk to. He had some great tales to tell, especially about his years in Westminster. What amazed me was that he retired undefeated after 18 years of being an MP. That, I would say, is quite some achievement. And the fact that he dedicated his retirement to the county is a further testament of his dedication to the people of Warwickshire. All of us in the Labour group had the deepest respect for him and were in awe of his political prowess and career. He is simply irreplaceable to us. 
Thank you, Helen. Um, I've ne next got uh, Councillor Jeff Morgan. Jeff. Thank you very much, um, Chairman, and congratulations to you and to Pete on your uh, on your elevation. <clears throat> I'd just like to say a few words from a personal angle about Bill and his wife Jill, who you see on on the screen in front of you. Jill sadly is in a care home now in Camp Hill, um, but together they were a wonderful couple. They're a lovely couple. Um, my, they, they were very good friends to my parents, uh, both my mother uh, and father. My dad knew Bill going back years and years and years uh, through the trade union movement. Um, he was an, an AEU official and um, uh, my dad used to take me along to the meetings, believe it or not. Um, but he did something that was really very, very remarkable. Um, in 2003, it was my father's 90th birthday, and Bill got Tony Blair to sign a birthday card and gave it to my, gave it to my father. And that meant an awful lot to him. He was very, very touched by that. And that taught me a lesson, really, um, if in, indeed I needed one, that friendship is what really matters in this life. Friendship trumps politics in my book um, every time, and they will both be terribly, terribly missed. They both came along to my mum and dad's funerals. They were loved throughout Stockingford and Nuneaton, and I will miss him personally very, very much indeed. So, R.I.P. Bill. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And now we've got uh, Jerry Roodhouse who'd like to say a few words. Jerry. Um, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Um, these next two are quite difficult. I've known Bill for a long time um, from when he became a member of Parliament. I didn't know him on the Nuneet and Beckwith Council. But I got to know Bill with some of the campaigning I was doing down at the House of Commons. And that's where I first came across um, across him and his, and his passion for what he was doing uh, and working on. Um, and then, of course, in later years, he arrived in Shire Hall into the antechamber and took on regulatory and um, you know, managed, managed that process through. And I think Jeff's right, really, um, in what he says about friendship. Um, Bill was a friend, uh, he was somebody he could talk to. And I can remember uh, as, you know, many times coming into Shire Hall and Bill would be sat in the antechamber on one of the chairs and, and next minute you were sat down beside him having a chat about everything that was going on um, and through there. And he sort of, it was one of those wonderful moments really. And on. But Bill and Jill together, I, I remember, were a, a strong team together. They were a pair working for their community, the passion and the communities that they stood up for, and his leadership around that and fighting for that. He would not give in. I think the pictures that are on the screen today truly demonstrate uh, Bill as the person that I remember. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I've next, next got Councillor Maggie O'Rourke. Maggie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, congratulations as well to you and to the Deputy Chair. Um, we have lost a very special man in Bill, and we've lost him during a time when we were unable to say goodbye properly. I've known Bill for over 20 years now, and I first met him when I was working for North Warwickshire Primary Care Trust, where I was the full-time Uniston convener at the time. And Bill and I campaigned together to get local NHS staff a pay increase. I think we would all agree that Bill is amongst a handful of politicians who were generally respected and popular across all of our political parties. He was a well-known and much-loved local politician who was always at the very heart of his local community. I think we would all agree that Bill was a fair and reasonable man and an honest broker. Bill cared about his community and his community respected him because they knew that his only ambition in life as a politician was to do right by them. 
Nuneaton and Bedward has lost a local champion who will be sadly missed, but his memory will live on and he will long be remembered as a local man who always did his best for the town. Rest in peace, Bill. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, next, I have Councillor Dave Parsons. Dave. Thank you, Chair. Uh, congratulations to yourself and uh, to Pete on, on taking office. And thanks to Nicola for her excellent uh, chairmanship over the past, uh, well, not just a year, a bit longer, wasn't it? But best wishes to you all. Um, yeah, I first met Bill uh, when we were both elected to the council in 2013. I quickly discovered that Bill was a good friend of Pete Mawson, who had been elected from my neighbouring district of Jordan. Pete and I frequently shared a car, so I got to know Bill very quickly. It didn't take long to discover that Bill was a totally decent man with total integrity, a wonderful sense of humour, and someone I was extremely proud to call a friend. We frequently met up in Weatherspoons, which was frequently referred to as his office during breaks in council meetings, and often for a, a, a post-council drink and post-mortem chat uh, at the end of a council meeting at Warsaw Common on the way home. I was, of course, intrigued to learn something of his years at Westminster. This was never anything that he flaunted, but if you asked, and he knew you were genuinely, genuinely interested, he would relate some of his tales and give you his views. Bill had a truly fascinating career. He had certainly come from humble beginnings. Born in Atherston in 1942, he passed for the grammar school at age 11, but didn't get to go because his parents couldn't afford the uniform and all the kits which the school required. It's easy to see that his deep and lifelong commitment to striving to achieve social justice came from. On entering the world of work, he went into engineering with Rolls-Royce, uh, became involved with the trade union, where he became area convener for the AU. He became a district councillor and rose to lead the council in Nuneaton before becoming Nuneaton's MP. He served for 18 years, and I quickly learned, unlike some within the party, Bill was no apologist for the Blair years. He was enormously proud of the fact that during those years, child poverty was reduced, homelessness virtually eliminated, and the rate at which the poor got left behind by the rich was dramatically reduced. He saw those factors as beacons of achievement and was justifiably proud of his part in it. He did reveal that he only once got into trouble with the Labour Party, and that was for calling someone love during a national conference. I retorted, perhaps you shouldn't have said it to Tony Blair, but he revealed it was a comment to a young lady, but said that had it been Tony, he'd have loved the laugh it would have produced. He simply said he'd have loved it. Of course, having made his impact in Westminster, where I'm assured by both past and present MPs that Bill was regarded with considerable respect and affection. He came to this council and made no lesser impact here. His experience, intelligence and integrity shone out. He had many good years, but sadly in the end, things did not go for well for Bill. He fought and won a battle with cancer, but then came the far more crippling blow. when, after a long and devoted marriage, his wife Jill fell victim to the increasingly serious symptoms of dementia. My last email exchange with Bill was when I expressed my sympathy and sorrow at what had befallen them. He replied that he was in a bit of a dark place, but was hoping to find his way out of it. It is my fervent hope now that Bill is in a much better place. A place which through a life of service, humility, concern for others and very real achievement, he has truly earned. I'd also very quickly like to say a little about Richard Chataway. I, I know more is to come. Um, but uh, with regard to Richard, again, Richard was a man I was proud to call a friend. His irrepressible sense of fun and detailed knowledge of council procedure made him a delight to work with and a very effective leader of the group. He was also a very firm friend of Bill's and so much wanted to be able to pay his tribute to Bill today. Two wonderful men, united in their purpose and commitment to this council. God bless you both. 
Thank you, Dave. Um, next, we have Councillor John Holland. John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Bill, of course, has uh, a national reputation and a local reputation. And I'm sure we all have our own individual memories. And if I just briefly share mine, Bill told me once that he was part of a parliamentary de delegation to Ukraine to visit the site of the Chernobyl power station. And uh, in their minibus, the MPs had a Geiger counter. And as they approached the site, uh, the alarm went off and they rapidly withdrew. So holding elected office isn't always easy, but I share all of the memories of the people before. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, I next have Councillor Judy Falk. Judy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Bill was a true Labour man, dedicated to his beloved Nuneaton. Uh, he often spoke about and supported both George Eliot Hospital and the Marianne Evans Hospice. Um, his passion for his area came over so well when he spoke at Council. His experience came over many years was shared with all, whatever political party you were. Um, I, I often used to chat to him in, in the antechamber before meetings. Um, I didn't go to his office at Weatherspoons, but I know my, my uh, former uh, independent councillor, Keith Lloyd, spent a, a happy break time often with, with Bill over there. And, and then we'd chat together when he, they both came back. Um, he will be sadly missed uh, by many um, of the people, those of us in the chamber and uh, his beloved Nuneaton. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I next have Councillor Keith Kandaka. Keith. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'm not the obvious person to pay tribute to Bill because we've had a lot of differences over the years. But a couple of outstanding things it is worth saying is how approachable he was and how he talked to everyone. He was always down the Newton Town Centre on a Saturday chatting to the locals. And at the County Council, he was always in the antechamber talking to people from a wide range of parties. Um, and he also did an awful lot to support the local brewing industry in, in the Neaton. Um, but I think it is really good to actually, with people who you've had differences, actually have a chat and actually be people about it. And Bill was always a great one to have a chat with. He'll be sadly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Sad loss. The last, the last one, but no means least, is, is Richard Chataway, who was uh, leader of the Labour group and suddenly passed away recently. And I'd like to uh, ask Helen Adkins to start the tribute. Helen. Thank you, Chair. Um, Richard's loss has hit us all incredibly hard over the last month, and I have missed him dreadfully. Um, he was our group leader and we valued him immensely. He led us with both skill and enormous dedication. He was always approachable, kind and generous. Personally, he taught many lessons over such a short period of time, not least of which was to choose your battles and hold fire. He always said he was a consensus politician, and this showed in the many good relationships he had with officers and colleagues right across the political spectrum. He was able to achieve a lot by finding common ground. Richard was a wonderful colleague and friend to all of us. He was always warm, friendly and kind. He was great to chat to and he had some intriguing stories. It seems he packed just so much into his life. Over the first few months of the COVID outbreak, he was amazing how he just kept going, despite being incredibly unwell. He was determined not to give up, he never did. I never heard him moan about his prognosis and even at the very end of his life, I know he surrendered with grace and never seemed to question why him. He was a brave man. I once said to him during the initial stages of the COVID outbreak, this is really quite stressful. And he said, compared to his tours of duty in Northern Ireland, this was nothing. His dedication to Warwickshire County Council and the Labour Party was second to none. And I remember back to the full councils um, before lockdown when he carried on attending, 100% committed, despite being really quite unwell. Even in the final few days of his life, one of his daughters got in touch with me to say Richard was going through all of his emails in case of anything important he should forward on. As a group, we miss, miss both Bill and Richard's presence and guidance, but we thank them for their years of service to the Labour Party and the people of Warwickshire. Finally, and notably, Richard died on the same day as Vera Lynn, 
and so I would like to end this tribute by expressing her sentiments in relation to both of them. We will meet again. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and now I'd like to, uh, to ask Councillor Izzy Seckham to speak. Izzy. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, this is a very sad day for us to have so many of our colleagues who have passed on, and particularly we, we are mentioning Richard at the moment, but I would like to start by saying I will miss Bill a great deal. Bill Oldman was a real guiding light, not just to his group, the Labour group, but actually to many of us. And he was a friend to new councillors, and he was a sage to old councillors. Uh, we will miss those characters. Richard, though, was another colleague who joined Warwick County Council at the same time as you and I, Chairman. He was a, a, a great friend. He'd been a councillor for many years before. He'd been on the Borough Council, I believe. But he really came across as a, a, a man who uh, wanted to represent his community. Uh, he was as passionate of his area. He was passionate of his Labour group. But he was also a thoroughly, thoroughly Warwickshire man all the way through. He never forgot his background in the armed forces and was a very staunch advocate uh, for that community and particularly with Bedworth. It was uh, always a pr proud for him to represent them in their um, armed forces day in November. He also, uh, in, after he finished working with Jaguar Land Rover, he took a position as a support worker for people with severe disabilities. Um, and I know this was a challenge that was a real, really tough for him, but really opened up his eyes to those who were more vulnerable. And he threw himself into that with passion and with commitment. Um, he also had a very keen eye for improving the quality of life for his local residents. And I know that none of them will forget him. It was a tribute to him, the uh, representation from his local community and, and the wider community at his funeral in a difficult time when we couldn't attend the funeral, they lined the streets. Uh, but I have, I have to just say, I always treat, will treat him as a friend. If he was great to spend time with, he was great to chat through, we spoke frequently, and he was incredibly proud to be a councillor for his Bedworth Central community for Warwickshire, and he was really proud to have left this life in office as leader of the Labour Group. Yeah, I think the uh, the chairman was muted temporarily <laughs> to stop some of the echoing. Um, the, the pictures in front of us of Richard Chatterway just clearly demonstrate to me the character of the man that I remember um, <clears throat> going forward. Um, R Richard, when I first really got to know Richard, was over the fire service, uh, those big red things with blue lights and his work and his around that and his and his detail that he used to go into into the budgets and the amendments and the figures uh, around all of that he used to pour over all the figures uh, and then used to come round and have a talk about them uh, as, as well and as is he's indicated um, at county council network conferences uh, many a time where we'd sit down together and talk about the issues that were facing the county facing the communities as well and clearly what shone through to me with Richard was was this passion again and his leadership around the community represented and hence why the pictures that are in front of us actually clearly remind me of him uh, he was a friend and uh, he'll be sadly lost um, by us all and um, but what goes through all the people that we've spoken about this morning I think is about their communities the way they represented their communities and how Warwickshire has been lucky to have such good people representing them and the people of them. So uh, all best in peace. Uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. I've next got Councillor Jonathan Chilvers. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you also for those moving tributes we've just heard um, for Richard. And just to add uh, a few words of my own, um, I I always enjoyed spending time with Richard. He used to wander along the corridor to the to the green group room to give words of uh, wisdom and uh, advice and for a chat. Um, and they were always uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and I think one of the things I most admire about Richard was his decision um, towards the end of his career, after that career in the army uh, and with Jaguar Land Rover, um, to retrain um, in the caring profession. Um, and I just really think that showed the heart of the man. Um, you know, the caring profession isn't always perceived uh, as it should be, um, as with the value it should be. Um, but Richard was prepared to, to retrain in that and throw his heart uh, into it. And I just think it showed his, his humility, uh, his practical approach and his uh, deeply caring nature. So, Richard, uh, I will miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, next, I've got Councillor Maggie O'Rourke. Maggie. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Richard uh, represented the people of Bedworth as an elected member, both as a borough and county councillor, and he was one of the longest serving councillors in Bedworth. I first met Richard when I was elected to this council nearly eight years ago. At that time, Richard was deputy leader of the Labour Group. And as a new councillor, he, he really made me feel welcomed and he gave me, and other new councillors, good advice and lots and lots of support. I know that Richard really enjoyed all of his time in politics and that he made many friends across party lines during his time here. Richard Lightbill was truly a man of the people. He was so very proud to represent the people of Bedworth. Over the years, Richard did many great things for his beloved Bedworth including raising lots and lots of money for local charities. I know that children with special educational needs were very close to Richard's heart, and he was particularly proud of the fact that his daughter worked in special educational needs in Brook School in, in rugby, and he often spoke to me about it. Richard, my friend, it was an absolute pleasure knowing you, working with you and learning from you. Your enthusiasm, commitment and contribution to local politics will be greatly missed but not forgotten. Rest in peace, Richard. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, next, we've got Councillor Corin Davis. Corin. Uh, apologies, but it said Caroline Davis and it's actually Caroline Phillips that's that's speaking. Uh, well, I've got Caroline Phillips. But I've also got Carol, uh, Corinne Davis. So oh, um, I'm not on the list, so I haven't prepared anything. So okay, well, okay, well, it's, uh, I'll move on then. Uh, sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Caroline Phillips. Caroline, are you there? Uh, thank you, Chair, and congratulations to you and to Pete. Uh, Mr Chairman, I, I feel blessed that I knew Richard Chataway. He was a man of true Labour values and he lived out those values all of his life. He came from humble beginnings, he was brought up on a council estate and was told by his school that he would never achieve anything. After leaving school, he joined the army and did two tours in Northern Ireland. He was a proud member of Bedworth Armistice Day Parade Group and was also a fundraising champion for them. He never missed a Remembrance Sunday or an Armistice Day. Richard was extremely proud of his hometown of Bedworth and served as a councillor for more than three decades. Working alongside his dear friend and colleague, Bill Hancock, who you can see on the photograph, the pair's teamwork had a huge impact. They resolved flooding issues, they championed the creation of Collycroft Residents Association, and they helped to restore and renovate Bedworth Cricket Club 
to the wonderful facility that we have today. Richard was first elected to, the count to this county council in 2001 and I've been proud to serve him first as a deputy and then as a leader of the Labour group. Richard was also, uh, he also helped with the local government association through doing peer reviews uh, where he shared his knowledge and skills with other local authorities. When Richard recently retired from his day job, he began doing sleepover shifts for a not-for-profit company who look after people with disabilities, as some people have already touched on. He was an amazing man, and he spent his whole life living out his labour labor values. Peace, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next, I have Councillor Andy Crump. Andy. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd just like to congratulate you on your election. Very well deserved, and I'm sure you make a great job of it. And I'd like to send my support and best wishes to Councillor Gilbert, too. Richard. Uh, we all know about Richard's military service, his affiliation to the NHS and the care sector, as well as his legendary support for service and ex-service personnel, particularly in the Bedworth area. Obviously, you can see a pattern of uniforms here. And I wish to talk about another uniformed area and thank Richard on behalf of Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service for the unstinting support he gave to our fire service. You could not find a better advocate or champion than Richard. He was always at Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service functions and on many occasions gave me the benefit of his, of his advice. I and Warwickshire Fire and Rescue Service will miss you and your wise words on fire and rescue matters. Richard, rest in peace. Sorry. Councillor Judy Fowl. Thank you. Um, Richard Lightfield was a, a, a Labour man totally dedicated to his, his area of Bedworth. Um, he led the county Labour group and I'm, I know was very supportive to them all. Uh, he certainly found time to speak to me about amendments his groups were pushing forward and uh, politics in the local area. Uh, we had some really good chats up on the um, balcony. Um, you knew he had read every single word on the reports that are uh, coming forward and that you were going to debate. And he had undertaken even more research on the topics and issues. He was very keen to bring points of order. Uh, and Tally, so he, he would let things progress for now, but he'd be having words with her. Um, truly dedicated man to his area and, and to all he did in his life. And, and as with Bill and Bernard, will be sadly missed. Thank you, Judy. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Councillor Peter Gilbert to say a few words. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, I will be brief, but I'm going to test your indulgence and speak about both Bill and Richard. Um, it is difficult to be brief about either of them, but I will try. Um, I knew Richard for 20, 25 years, uh, perhaps longer, and first really had contact with him when I was a very crazy rock and roll teenager and would go and ask questions from the gallery at the Nuneaton and Bedworth Town Hall. And this particular issue that I was raising and questioning was reasonably critical of the controlling Labour group. Um, but Richard was interested in the subject matter and waited and spoke to me after the meeting and actually got involved with that issue and did some great work on that. So I will always remember Richard for that. And then I knew Richard, obviously, through those years as a local campaigner, as mayor of Nuneaton and Bedworth, um, and then obviously, obviously as a county councillor. He was passionate about Bedworth and had done a lot of work for a lot of people. I have had people who voted for me back in 2017 who weren't obviously residents of Richard's division, but would also say that I voted for you, but Richard Chataway has done much work for me in the past. So he was very respected in that in, in Bedworth. 
strong advocate for the Armistice Committee. And two final things on Richard. Um, his military service, which he spoke of rarely, but when you actually had conversations with him, as Councillor Adkins alluded to. Interesting, perhaps, is not the right word, but he certainly served his country and had done things which I think were a testament to the way he dealt with his illness in later years. I honestly don't believe I've met anybody who has dealt with an illness such as that with the courage that he did. He never whinged. It wasn't mentioned. He, he was really admirable in that respect. And I will miss him in Bedworth. And I will certainly miss his rhubarb, which from the allotment was a real treat. So a uh, great respect for Richard. And then Bill, finally, Mr. Chairman, I'll be brief. I knew Bill for longer than Richard. I knew Bill from when I was a child. In fact, I don't think I don't remember not knowing Bill. He was a friend of my father's. My father was a staunch conservative, but actually voted for Bill in 1992 because the way Mrs. Thatcher had been treated by the Conservative government. And Bill said to my father, I never thought she'd get me a vote, but I'll take it anyway. But Bill was around Nuneaton and Bedworth for many years. He served as leader of Nuneaton and Bedworth Borough Council. When I became leader, he phoned to congratulate me. Not many people phoned to congratulate me, but Bill did. I also remember Bill as mayor and reminded him when I was elected to the county council that I had a picture at home of me sitting on his knee in the mayoral car. He said, I hope you don't want to recreate that picture. His humour was always there. He also supported me in getting an internship in Parliament, knowing full well that I was a Tory. Uh, and he, he helped me in many ways. I wrote many letters to him about varying subjects, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, um, uh, um, hunting and so on. He always came back with a response and, and was always interested in the questions that I raised. I think both Bill and Richard came from a time when you could be on opposing political views and different sides of a political argument, but still not leave the room and be nasty and vitriolic on Twitter and Facebook and be personal. And that, I believe, helps any council, any political body in moving forward. It is important that we remember the human aspects of everybody. Um, politics, to me, is important. I am a passionate uh, conservative, but I'm also a passionate Democrat. And I believe those were um, aspects in their life that they uh, respected too. So they will be sadly missed by me and many people of Nuneaton Bedworth and this county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pete. Um, I've now got Councillor John Holland who'd like to say a few words. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I really miss Richard. Uh, he just always seemed to be in Shire Hall, uh, someone to go to, someone very approachable always cheerful, always positive, and always coming up with credible strategies for dealing with some really complex issues. Um, the comments from Councillor Gilbert, I think, summed up um, an awful lot there. He was very dedicated, um, committed, and of course, one of the advantages of our video meetings is that Richard was able to carry on, even attending meetings from being in hospital, which I think really does show a dedication to duty. I think um, there were a few times that Richard asked me to represent him at meetings that he couldn't get to. And I always regarded that as an exceptional honour. Um, Richard, I will really miss you. Thank you. Thank you, John. That's all the list of speakers I have uh, speaking for Richard Chataway. Uh, I've got nobody uh, sign, uh, indicating they would want to speak as well. But uh, it's a very, very sad time. We've lost a, a lot of very serious uh, players and uh, we've put all the poor for it. And I think it's appropriate that we all show a minute's silence. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We now, we, now, we now move on to item number six, which is public speaking, and we have two speakers here today. And the first one is a Susan Rasmussen, who's speaking as a member of the Clean Air for Leamington in support of the Green Group Notice of Motion. So, uh, Susan, the floor is yours, wherever you are. Thank you. Do we have you on the line? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, in that case, uh, we'll. Oh, she is here. She is here. Hello, Susan. Please, uh, if you'd like to start speaking, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much. You might need to turn your microphone off, Susan. I temporarily lost connection. I, I, I haven't. Um, I haven't been joining you for the last couple of minutes. Are you addressing me, Susan Rasmussen? I am, Susan. Yes, yes. I've just introduced you as a member of the Clean Air for Leamington uh, people to, in support of the the Green Group of mo uh, motion. So we're you, happy to hear what you have to say. Yes, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Susan, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm afraid it looks like we've lost uh, Susan, which is uh, hopefully she'll be able to rejoin us. So. Uh, I, I'll move on to our second public speaker, which is Sally Duns, who uh, wants to talk about the uh, Capital Investment Fund regarding Warwick Town Centre. So, uh, Sally, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, shall I turn my camera on? Please do. Uh, okay. Hello there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm quite nervous, so, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> so my name, my name's Sally. Um, I've lived in Warwick for over 25 years and Hampton Magna for about 18 years uh, with my husband and two boys. Um, I've always loved cycling and um, lockdown's been really hard, but one thing that we've loved is cycling as a family um, and it's felt really safe on the roads. Um, and I've loved seeing other families out for bike rides as well. But recently, I've been cycling through Warwick um, and after getting used to the changes, um, I'm really appreciating some of the cycle routes that have popped up, um, for example, in Castle Hill. Um, so it normally takes me about nine minutes to cycle in from Hampton Magna to Warwick. Um, and I'm looking forward to when some of the roadworks are finished, um, as I imagine other people are as well, um, which will hopefully ease some of the congestion and uh, the cycle, cycle route will be completed over the pavements. Um, for me, joined up cycle routes are so important because um, if there's a dangerous section, it makes the bits that are good um, just um, pointless, especially when I'm when cycling with children, especially when I'm cycling with my children. Um, I feel quite lucky in Hampton Magna um, as a kind of outlying village um, and I guess I think it would be good for all areas surrounding Warwick to have equally good family friendly cycling routes for all cycle abilities into the centre of Warwick, especially with all the new housing developments including the one in Hampton Magna um, which will add more cars to the road um, and hopefully um, There'll be more e-bikes as well, which are getting more popular and hopefully they'll get a bit cheaper um, for help up some of the hills in Warwick. Um, so safety is one of my key issues, especially to get children 
um, into um, good habits of not depending on cars. Um, so I work for the NHS in mental health and outdoor activity, walking, cycling is just so much better for our overall mental and physical health. Um, there's less air pollution, as we all know, um, especially health issues for unborn babies, young children and those with pre-existing health issues, more exercise, more fresh air, it's more sociable than driving and there's a bit of interaction and it's cheap and easily accessible. I drive a car as well, um, but as a motorist, um, I believe that pedestrians, cyclists and buses should be prioritised. So I had a chance to read through the notes and um, can really appreciate the goals behind them and how they might make Warwick town centre a nicer place. Um, I hope it can be done in a um, time scale, not too much in the distant future. Got 15 seconds, um, Sally. OK, so I imagine with some pushback from other motorists, but um, change is needed and lockdown has shown us what it can look like. I've finished now. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed and well said. Thank you, everybody. Um, and we're now going back to our first speaker, Susan, and I can see you now. And uh, if you'd like to speak, you've got three minutes to speak about in support of the Green Party motion. So over to you, Susan. I can't hear you. You've got your mic on. Are we there yet? Hello. We can I'm hear you. It says. I'm sorry, the internet connection is really slow. Yeah. Well, we can hear you, but we can't see you. But if, <laughs> well, <that's... laughs> if we can hear you, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'm chairman of Leamington Town Council, but I don't presume to speak on their behalf. I start by quoting from the policy paper issued by the Department of Transport on the 9th of May with a foreword by Grant Shapps. He says, we have a once in a generation opportunity to deliver a lasting transformative change in how we make short journeys in our towns. Active travel is affordable, delivers significant health benefits, has been shown to improve well-being, mitigates congestion, improves air quality and has no carbon emissions at point of use. Towns and cities based around active travel will have healthier and happier citizens, as well as lasting economic benefits. The government therefore expects local authorities to make significant changes to give more space to cyclists and pedestrians. Such changes will help embed altered behaviours seen recently and demonstrate the positive effects of active travel. I urge you all to consider how you can begin to make use of the tools in this guidance to make sure you do what is necessary and provide a lasting legacy of greener, safer transport. The policy paper makes it clear none of these measures are new. They are standard elements of traffic management toolkit. But a step change, he says, in the urgency of their rollout is needed. They include cycle lanes segregated. Lanes indicated by road markings will not deliver the level of change needed. We should encourage walking and cycling to school and adopt the concept of school streets. We should introduce lower speed limits. 20 mile an hour limits should be the maximum for residential roads and many through streets. Lower limits are not themselves enough, but in association with other measures, provide a more attractive and safer environment. We need to create pedestrian and cycle zones and street networks where space is shared and the car does not dominate. We should adopt whole route approaches to create corridors, buses, cycles and access only on routes into towns and city centres. These are exactly the sorts of things the people of Leamington said they wanted as priorities during three years of public consultation for our neighbourhood plan. We have not one single conservative politician at any level of government through town, district, county councils or at national level. But that does not mean the ruling administration of the county can ignore the wishes of its largest town. And it's yet more difficult for Warwickshire County Council to ignore a policy paper from the Secretary of State for Transport. What possible reasons can there be to ignore his directions and fail to reprioritise planning assumptions and financial resources? As Mr Shapps points out, none of this is new. So I urge you to vote in favour of the motion before you and draw up an action plan with Warwick District and the other districts and boroughs to implement the measures we in Leamington want to see and the Secretary of State wants to see. Warwickshire can be a beacon You've got 10 seconds. Carbon neutrality and a sustainable system of active and public transport that will create a healthy and prosperous legacy for all our residents. Thank you.
Thank you very much and very well said. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. And it's a shame about the, dis the, the connections, but you, we got you in the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That is the end of the public speaking. We now come on to item four of the agenda, which is appointments to committees and other bodies. And I'd like to invite the leader of the council, Izzy Second, to move the recommendations as circulated. circulated. But first of all, I'd like to ask is if you have a seconder. I, I do have a seconder. Um, I think you have that. Helen Adkins, are you, are you, are you yes. Yeah. Are you going to, you're going to second this? Yep, that's right, Chair. Okay. You, do you want to reserve your right to speak? Or yes, just... sorry. Uh, yes, a second and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Second. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. I, I won't keep the Council too long. Uh, we have spent some time in trying to get the, uh, the committees all sorted out. There have been some slight changes, but by and large, they will remain the same as they have been previously. Uh, there are some small changes adjusting the numbers on the committees, which you will be aware of. Um, and sadly, we have had some, um, as we've already notified, we've had some uh, gaps because we have lost um, one or two of our friends and colleagues over the last few months. So we have had circulated prior to this uh, the appointment uh, paper, and I would like to move that and confirm the committee structure um, and the delegation to the member bodies uh, that are part of the recommendation. Um, I move the paper, please, Chairman. Are you on mute? Going on. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Seckham. Uh, I have no other indication of other speakers, so I'd like to ask Councillor Helen Atkins to come in as a seconder. Helen. Yep, nothing further to say, Chair. Happy with all the appointments. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Seckham, do you want to sum up? Or? Um, uh, no, I think we can move to the vote. Okay. Right, OK, uh, we'll go to the vote. and I'd like to ask uh, Monica to add up. Are there any, can I ask yes. councillors, are there any votes again? Can councillors vote again? Any abstentions? In which case that vote is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now go on to item number five, which is the Overview and Scrutiny Committee's annual report for 2019. 2020. Uh, I believe Councillor Yusuf Damash is going to propose this. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Redford. Okay. Do you want to reserve your right to speak? I, I do, Chairman. I apologise. I was desperately trying to get in. <laughs> okay. So, answer, uh, 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 so I'd ask uh, Councillor Yusuf Damash to uh, introduce this report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, to move the report and to take my chance to speak now. Uh, I know that other scrutiny committee chairs and members will want to speak also, so I hope you'll forgive me if I focus primarily on the Children and Young People Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which I chair. Firstly, can I place on record my thanks to everybody who has been involved in the work carried out by the committee over the past year? The support the committee has received from council officers has been invaluable. But I would in particular like to place on record my thanks to Helen Barnsley and all of the Electric Service Officers who worked tirelessly to ensure the smooth operation of the committee over the last 12 months, something which has been especially challenging in the most recent months. I'd also like to thank both Councillor Morgan and Councillor Hayfield for their engagement with the committee. And although members always robustly challenge them, as they should, the relationship is always predicated on all sides wanting to achieve the very best outcomes for children and young people in the county. Mr Chairman, the, the pandemic has impacted us all and inevitably it affected the operation of the committee for several months as the country went into lockdown. We were unable to meet formally for some months, but it was incredibly pleasing when we were able to do so in June and then again earlier this month, with both meetings being held virtually, as is the temporary new norm, I do hope it is temporary. But prior to the lockdown, Mr Chairman, the committee had endeavoured to hear more first-hand accounts from frontline council staff members, as well as families who access our services. 
we have made some good strides on that front, but there's certainly more to do moving forward. And that's because I personally firmly believe that an essential part of scrutiny is ensuring that those words presented to committees in reports are a true reflection of the situation on the ground for those who are delivering and receiving our services on a day-to-day -day basis. As members will know, the committee has a broad remit and those services that we scrutinise are subject to ever-increasing demand, with education and children's services continuing to provide the bulk of our workload. But no matter the subject area that's being poured over, it's always abundantly clear that every member of the committee is fully committed to ensuring that every child in Warwickshire has the best start in life and are supported throughout their formative years and beyond. There's always a step more members on securing equality of opportunity for Warwickshire people. Mr Chairman, this council is always looking to the future and evolving something which is special at this time given the wider conversation in councils across the county and the Children and Young People Overview and Scrutiny Committee is no different. Over the past year we've paid particular attention to those services which are designed to improve the mental and physical well-being of young people in Warwickshire and to education and family development projects. Over the past year we also introduced pre-meetings, uh, pre-meeting briefings rather, for the committee with the intention of providing the opportunity for additional member development and training, but also the chance to meet with frontline council staff. And we met with social workers uh, before the pandemic, which was which was really um, engaging and something I think we should do again. But sadly, the pandemic led those meetings to be suspended. But as the lockdowns eased, I really do hope they're reinstated and that they evolve and expand over time and help provide committee members with further insight into the work that's carried out by this council and that work which falls within our committee remit. So to draw to a close, Mr Chairman, I hope that as members have read through the committee reports contained within the paper, they'll have been reminded of the good cross-party collegiate work that the council's committees are well known for, and I'm very happy to formally move. Thank you, Councillor Danemash. Um, do any uh, members or councillors want to talk on this subject before I bring in Wallace? Councillor Childers. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to echo um, what Councillor Damash said in two areas. Um, firstly, to thank um, um, Councillor Hayfield and Councillor Morgan for their really constructive engagement um, as part of the uh, Children and Young People's uh, um, committee. It's um, it's a really uh, good model, and I appreciate um, their uh, engagement in in the meeting. Uh, and the second thing is, um, Councillor Mash highlighted some of the times when we've had members of staff or members of the public uh, speaking, and I think this is where um, overview and scrutiny can really add an awful lot of value uh, and perspective, and it's uh, a different perspective. And I think it's. Um, these have kind of, if you can see from the report, these times have kind of been the highlights of um, the committee's uh, work. And so I really want to see this become a routine part of uh, the ONS uh, committees to have uh, members of the public or, or professionals coming and speaking to committees. It shouldn't just be an exception. It should be a, a normal uh, part of committee, committee work. The second thing I want to say is... Um, that where I still think as committees we need to improve what we do is that we still um, aren't great at coming up with really focused specific recommendations in committees and I think we need to spend more time thinking about how we um, forge appropriate really specific recommendations um, rather than a rather vague uh, noting of the things uh, of the report so um, and linked to that I think we found this um, remote working that there's opportunities for really timely one item meetings when something urgent crops up uh, so rather than waiting two months or three months to the meeting the committee could be meeting uh, when the one agenda meet one item agenda meeting um and that would be uh the committee can do really timely work in that so um i hope we can carry on moving forwards um in the way that the overview and scrutiny committees work thank you very much thank you thank you councillor i'd just like to say a few words as well as the 
past chairman of the Communities of Union Scrutiny Committee, and I echo what uh, the previous speaker, because we have been uh, talking about subjects which uh, have created a lot of public interest. And we've had a lot of uh, members of the public attending our meetings. We've been speaking about anything from climate change to roads to on-street parking. And I think this has been a great sort of uh, advert for, for, for scrutiny. And we have had one-issue meetings that we, we, we organise at very short notice. So um, I'd also like to go on to Councillor Adrian Warwick, who'd like to speak as well. Councillor Warwick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to say, as the Chair this year of the Resources, Fire and Rescue Overview and Scrutiny Committee, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to start with to my Vice Chair, Parminder Singh Verdi, and to the Opposition spokesman on the on the panel, Councillors O'Rourke and Councillors Falk, for their productive engagement with this and uh, working with me to make this the scrutiny process uh, the. the I'd like to thank the officers Helen, Helen Barnsley and John for their help. Uh, the minute I do not note, I don't think Bill Alton's involvement in the panel, and I very much like that to be a valued member of the panel over the last. I think what we should note is that once we scrutinise the work of the fire service and the work of, uh, of the, um, the, the officers, heritage and culture, through, through this year and the other things we've looked at, it's been the result of the fire and council officers that have got us through the last year. And I really would like to think we place on, on record our thanks to the fire service and to our, our officers and staff for the work that they have done so to keep the council running and to keep the community running. And I think that's one thing because of the pandemic that isn't clearly brought out. And I hope next year we are very, very clear of, of what has been done by all of the, uh, the fire service, our officers, our staff, to keep this council running through this very difficult time. Thank you, Councillor Warwick. I now got Councillor Kadaka who'd like to speak. Keith. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, scrutiny has lots of good advantages in Warwickshire. It is really good the way that members who suddenly have an interest in the subject can attend to other scrutiny boards. And I particularly pay tribute to Councillor Redford, who allowed us to speak at the uh, uh, adult social care and health recently about the COVID outbreak. I think it is really good that people can uh, get involved and take an interest. Uh, I'm looking forward to joining that board uh, panel in the next year. So I think the scrutiny is really good at the county because we do actually let people talk and people can choose scrutiny panels in which they've got an interest in. And I know people have particular passions. So that's really good. Uh, one thing I'm a bit wary of is actually being rushed at scrutiny meetings. Um, and with all the changes and all the things going on, I do hope we take the time to do scrutiny well. And the point that Jonathan was making about single issue scrutiny meetings, I think will be a good thing to take forward because we can then get those useful members of the public involved, particularly around the health one. We had some GPs and people involved in the scrutiny meeting that really gave some depth to the meeting. So I, I, I look forward to really good scrutiny in the next year uh, and I'm happy to support this report. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, do I have any other speakers? And in that case, I'd like to ask uh, Councillor Redford to come back as seconder. Councillor Redford. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and uh, may I just congratulate you and uh, Pete on your appointments. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to uh, support um, all of which um, uh, Yusuf has uh, already uh, gone through. But in particular, if I might just make some comments regarding uh, my own committee, uh, Adult Social Care and Health. First, I would also like to thank all the members uh, of the committee um, for their support and commitment over the year. And I know members will wish me to place on record our thanks to all our officers um, for their commitment, in particular during the current crisis, um, which has been very difficult, um, but they have coped, I think, admirably. And it is worth, I think, pointing out that clearly 
our future program of work is going to reflect many issues um, raised by the COVID crisis. And uh, it is my intention uh, that uh, the COVID will appear on our agenda, uh, certainly for the uh, near future, uh, as a permanent item um, for um, report. Uh, I was interested in the in the comment about uh, single item meetings, uh, and um, we are we are doing that. Our, in fact, our next meeting uh, is going to be a single item, uh, and certainly I can see that over the current year that um, I will be in the position of uh, going further on on that particular area. We also take up the opportunity to have briefing sessions uh, before our meetings, and I, I know that uh, members appreciate um, those sessions in particular. We have been working well with our um, neighbouring areas, in particular with um, um, Coventry. Uh, we have a good relationship. Um, with the joint HOSC, uh, and I know that um, uh, that will continue um, to benefit. Um, one of the key, key areas that I'm sure members will have noted from the report was the review of the stroke services, um, which um, uh, the joint committee uh, endorsed. I would also like, in particular, to place on record um, the committee's thanks to our Director of Public Health, uh, Sade, um, for the excellent um, uh, briefings that she has given to members uh, and their clarity. It is uh, very welcome the way that she has made us understand uh, the issues that are, that are being raised. We are working well with our, our um, uh, local CCGs, and, and that is an issue which is being developed uh, further. And I'm sure that we are going to um, have many questions coming up regarding um, uh, the CCGs and, in particular, um, their mo uh, proposed mo merger. Um, so I will, I will end there, uh, Chairman, uh, and um, say that um, I, I second, uh, I second the uh, the motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Redford. Uh, now I'd like to ask Councillor Darmash to sum up. Use it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe there's anything else that's needed to say. So happy to formally move. Okay. Can I, we'll take a vote to on whether this is going to be approved and ask uh, Monica to do the count. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So if I could invite any councillors voting against the motion to put their hand up now. Any abstentions? In which case, um, we assume all in favour and so the vote is carried. Thank you very much, Monica. We now come on to item number six, which is a monitoring report uh, of decisions taken under urgency and calling. And I'd like to ask the leader, is he second to uh, move the recommendation? Thank you, Chairman. This is a regular report that I bring to Council, um, but unusual this year. So I will take it in two parts. The first part is there were five uh, reports that were, uh, went under urgency and decisions before COVID. And you will see that in part six of the report, you will see that there were 12 decisions that were made under urgencies, uh, under urgency report. And I think it is worth spending a little time because it gives, it depicts the work that this council has done over the last few months in responding to the concerns of residents, to the requests from government and in our obligation to look after our residents and uh, our partners. Um, so the first item was around a contingency planning arrangements was really just around uh, a requirement for us to put in place a business model that would take us into 
the uh, lockdown process. Um, and that was the first one. The second one was on the 25th of March, uh, we we made an urgency decision based on business grants and cash flow. This was in order to give a grant to districts who were supporting grants to business a week earlier than the government business grant that had been made available. And it meant that we could get businesses started early on helping to regulate their system and, and support. Uh, the third one was a delegation for enforcing the business closure measures relating to COVID. And in particular, this related to trading standards as well. Uh, the fourth item was around um, early years funding. We provided support to our private and our own maintained uh, nurseries in order that they should be able to stay open to provide support for uh, key workers at this difficult time and to keep their provision in operation. Uh, key workers and I should say vulnerable children as well. Item five uh, that we supported out of the 12 was to support our care market, um, to help them with the funding that came through, passporting it through to them to help our care homes in their response and in their provision of, of safety measures to help their residents. The sixth item that um, met uh, had a, an urgency was in the early April, which again was uh, to uh, support a decision uh, to bring forward councillors' grants. This was this is our six thousand pound per year councillor grant, and there was um, much request through members present to allow that to come early to support the COVID response of the voluntary and communities in our own areas. And I think we all of us uh, will recognise that response and thank people for helping to support our communities themselves. And this has been a partnership that has worked extremely well. Seventh item was the CARE Act easements. This was in order to help us to more quickly uh, make make the provisions for uh, support to people who need their assessment quickly. Uh, it did not mean that we were in any way reducing the offer. It absolutely allowed us that easement to get more quickly the assessment done and get them into support and care. Um, eighth item was on the 20th of April was a bid. Um, this is the Business Improvement District Cash Flow Loan Scheme, um, a decision to help business again uh, in our town centre. The ninth item was a, a business interruption loan, and, and this was one that we did through the, um, the LEP, and it was a reinvestment trust, allowing those businesses who perhaps hadn't been able to access the grants that had been made earlier because of circumstances, but we knew that they had opportunity to thrive and fly, and this gave them the opportunity to access funds through, um, through our uh, investment fund. The tenth item was a rent-free period. Uh, again, we run some commercial properties, startup com start business se sectors, and we knew how difficult it was for our businesses that were tenants within those properties to pay their rent and to manage to keep going. And this gave us the opportunity to show our support to those business and give them a rent-free rent period for three months um, during that time. Uh, the 11th was a treasury management early pension payments um, scheme. And the 12th was the grant of leasehold interest on a farm business tenancy as well. Um, we have been working extremely hard to support businesses, to support residents, to support our partners in trying to respond to the needs of our residents through the COVID lockdown period. And I'm very proud of everything the council has done. And I would particularly like to thank our officers who have responded so well. I move the report.
Uh, thank you, Councillor Second, for explaining that in great detail. Do I have a seconder? Uh, I would like to second that report, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, do I have any speakers on this? Uh, no? Yep. No. Jonathan Chilvers, you would like to say a few words. Oh, oh, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just like to comment briefly on um, the urgent decisions made during the, the crisis period, um, because um, at the start of the crisis, there was a risk that we would, um, as emergency powers came in, that we would lose kind of that dem democratic transparency. Um, and actually, a lot of other councils around the country, chief executives ended up making all the decisions and there just wasn't that transparency to the public. Um, and democracy isn't, as we know, just an add-on. Actually, democracy and transparency improves our decision making. Um, and so I just really want to say that in Warwickshire, I think um, on the whole, we did a really, really good job of trying to um, maintain that quick decision making, but also that democratic uh, transparency. All of those urgent decisions were put into the public domain. Um, which gave an opportunity for people to comment. It gave an opportunity for us as councillors to contact people we thought might be interested in the decisions being made. Um, and all the cabinet decisions that weren't taken in cabinet, again, went through, were published in advance, um, even though they were made as leaders' decisions. So I just think we did a really good job on that part of it. Um, I think we were a bit slow on getting um, over and scrutiny and council going, which um, but we're there now. Um, but I think in that in that crisis period, I think we did uh, a well in managing to keep that uh, uh, that transparent element and showing also that we were able to make agile and quick decisions while still being open uh, about it. And some of the the response rates of officers and um, and and um, uh, portfolio holder members certainly to my questions were extremely rapid and and thorough in that period um, and so again I think there's some lessons going forward as an organization that we can make decisions quickly but also carry on making them well with the necessary democratic uh, transparency that helps us to make good decisions so I'll be uh, supporting this report. Thank, yeah, you. thank you Jonathan I next have uh, Councillor Keith Kandaka to say to speak. <clears throat> thank you very much Chair uh, just a point on the um, electric buzz initiative, because that was one of these um, key decisions that really came out as really good news by surprise. Um, no. But actually, it being an emergency decision with no free warning did mean it was difficult to ask a lot of questions about it. Uh, and it being a joint project with Coventry, there's obviously a lot of risks of things going wrong, like the uh, railways. Um, Bay platform issues so it was an area I wanted a lot of reassurance on and I think for these key decisions where a bid is going in and we obviously can't approve the bid until just before it has to go in we should have a bit more of a radar actually saying um, particularly to the members maybe that OSC committee uh, in two weeks we're putting a bid in um, just so that we get a bit more oversight yeah we really don't want to muck up and delay these really important bids but what we do want to do is ask some questions about the details. I was actually quite pleased with some of the details I found out. I think the Electric Buzz Initiative is going to be a game changer, which is why I'm passionate that we actually get early warning about it and get it right. So I'm very happy we're doing this, but please can we have the warning of the surprise? Because, as I say, there's so much we need to get right on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I now have Councillor Mark Cargill who would like to speak. Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Um, first, I'd just like to say I, I echo some of the thoughts that have been met, uh, passed already. I, I also would like to say that I felt that the briefings that were uh, put out by both the leader and the, and the chief exec were very well appreciated by the residents around the around certainly in my area, I can only speak for Stratford District, but very, very well appreciated. And again, the openness and the transparency of what was going on, I thought was appreciated, warts and all. Um, I'd like to just say also that the districts and boroughs in Warwickshire also responded extremely well in this crisis. And at the end of the day, it made the whole of Warwickshire into a top performer. There's no taste about that. I think people have actually said, well done to Warwickshire, 
as a as an overall thing as well so it's not just you know don't don't say it's just one little part of it everyone pulled together and i felt that it was a really a really good effort and just one little thing the crisis isn't over yet anyway thank you very much chair uh thank you thank you mark um i've got no uh, any other councillors indicating to speak uh pete you, peter butlin you didn't indicate you you wanted to reserve your right to speak so uh, I'll go yeah, straight back. Uh, I'm quite happy with what's been said, and I, 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 I thank you for the uh, comment, warm comments from the other speakers. Thank you. Okay, so back to you, Councillor Seckham, to sum up. So thank you for the comments. They've been very helpful. What I think has been a real benefit through the COVID period has been what Jonathan has talked about, that agility of the council, the speed of uh, movement and getting on with uh, with decisions as required. Uh, we need to keep that uh, throughout, N not losing, of course, the democratic input. But I have to say the speed of decision making is something that I think should be an, in uh, an investment out of COVID. Um, the uh, the ability of overview and scrutiny being a bit slow, I think we would all wish to have been moving smoothly into uh, the, the system of committees that we have known and liked for long enough. I, I recognise what you say, Jonathan. I think um, I think we were as speedy as most other authorities. I think um, it the technology. Uh, has been pretty jolly good, actually. Uh, you know, here we are still using virtual conferencing, and it, it is a great benefit. It probably took a little while to get into that, but I think to have moved on to home working, the 90% of our staff within one week was a fantastic achievement and really cannot be underestimated. Um, uh, Keith asks about the um, ability to be more engaged in decisions. There is a bit of a clue in the fact that they are decisions of urgency that, uh, because we need to be able to move on them extremely quickly. I think what we have learned through this COVID period is that actually there's been a really good engagement um, with leaders uh, across the political party and that has benefited our decision making um, and Mark I do entirely agree um, it has been a, a grand effort on behalf of all stakeholders um, and at the end of the day what we want is the best for people in Warwickshire and we'll continue to provide that. Thank you. I move the paper and the recommendation. Thank you very much Councillor Seckham. We will go to the vote. Thank you, Thank Chair. You, Chair. So, so could, could I have, I have any, any votes against, against no the report? Any abstentions? Any abstentions? In which case the report is noted and the vote carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. And the item number, we're next on to item number seven, which is the uh, Treasury Management Report. And I'd like to ask Councillor Butlin to move the recommendations. Peter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a, a thing that we do annually in terms of strategy in which we manage the uh, uh, reserves that we hold and also the investments that we make in terms of borrowing money. Um, the uh, something I'm going to basically say, which if you turn to 1.3, the strategy has not been changed as a result of COVID-19. However, changes may be required to how Treasury activity is managed in the new post-COVID environment and to support the recovery. Any changes will be subject to separate reports later in the year if and is, as is appropriate. And, and this is something I think will be repeated on a lot of reports that come before us because a lot of these reports are written primarily before COVID and the shutdown. <clears throat> um, we've got uh, uh, to go through the kind of different changes that we've done. Uh, the, it's got a longer dated benchmark reflects the intention to commit funds for an average longer period of time to access higher returns. In other words, we're looking to borrow money over longer periods of time to get better returns. Uh, the other one is investment limits. 
this is kind of a, a explained in 2.4, but this is what I would use to call spreading risk. Uh, we're not putting too many kind of things into one one pot and and, and spread the risk to the local to our authority. We're also in kind of involved with ethical investments. Uh, and we have a strategy also that's taken into account the fact that we've declared a climate emergency. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is we're taking into account into the investment strategy, we're investing, in splitting their strategy into two. One is for service investments, which is where investment is primary for the purpose of supporting the delivery of an organisational or service objective. And secondly, commercial investments, uh, where an investment is primary for the purpose of generating an income stream or return to support an overall financial position for the local authority. And as you know, in previous papers that have gone through just recently, we are taking a more commercial attitude uh, in, in this ca uh, council and also making investments into property companies and uh, place shaping, etc. So that one is to uh, take that into account. Um, the uh, and that is pretty well it. And I'm kind of I'd like to move this uh, paper for adoption and also willing to take any questions. So do we have a seconder? Councillor Warwick. Thank you, Chair. My, in, my internet connection's a little bit intermittent. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'd like to second this and uh, reserve my right to speak. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any speakers on this subject? No, I can't see any, so... Um, yes, sorry. Can you come to call first? Sorry, Keith come to call. You'd like to speak? Sorry. Yeah, that's OK. I think there's delays in the uh, internet that means buttons take a while to propagate through. Um, yeah, there's obviously a massive change of risk profile, though, having gone through COVID, or the first part of COVID. Uh, particularly on property investments, um, we don't know what demand is going to be for property, both commercial and residential going forward. So uh, the risk profile has got to change massively as a result of that. And some of the councils that have over-invested or have been over-ambitious may now actually have trouble being going concerns. And yeah, it talks about things like inter-council loans uh, and what we do, um, setting up a um, local council um into council loan board, whatever it's called. Um, so I think we do need to actually be very careful in dealing with other councils. Yeah, councils like Stratford and Avon, people may have thought would, would once be a, a, a massive cash cow. And obviously the tourism industry for a few years is going to be knocked and the whole risks area has been turned upside down. So uh, I, I don't know when and where we actually do a reappraisal of risk, but we need to do it urgently before we start putting money into new organisations uh, and who knows if the property market is going to crash by 30% for households or go down by 2 or 3% but there's a definite risk um, and that will also then affect our returns from uh, selling land which may be difficult for the next 3 or 4 years. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Kandaka. We have now got uh, Jerry Roodhouse who would like to say a few words. Jerry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just getting the connections going. Um, just a couple of points, really, as Peter will um, recognise um, the paragraph on ethical investments, which I remember never used to exist in this document some years ago, and I used to put down amendments to the document to try and get it in, in there. So it's pleasing to see that this is now starting to take a bigger part of this document, and certainly with the climate change uh, motion and the actions that the Council is taking, I think is only right to do so. Um, but I recognise some of the dangers and risks that uh, have been mentioned by Keith as well coming out of this. But I do believe looking at the markets and speaking to, to some people elsewhere who do a lot of investments, actually the ethical investment side is going to be ramping up more. So I hope that we grasp any opportunities that we can uh, to do that uh, as we as we go forward. Thank you very much. Um, we have no other speakers, so I'd like to go back to Councillor Warwick and ask you as a seconder. Councillor Warwick. Thank you very much, Chair. 
as uh, as uh, Councillor Butlins pointed out, this is a, a very much a technical document that, that outlines the investment strategy of this council moving forward. It is the undoubted strength of Warwickshire County Council's financial position that has enabled us to be so flexible and responsive through the financial through the crisis that we've suffered with COVID. I take on board the points that have been made by Councillor Roodhouse. I too am very pleased to see that the points on ethical investment and uh, the points on risk assessment. But we must remember that there is always risk. And we need to make sure that as a county council, we are we are supporting businesses to recover from what has been a once in a hundred years crisis. And I think the council has been flexible. I think it's been responsive and I think we've done an excellent job. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased with this document. As Council Butlin's pointed out, the one thing we are going to undoubtedly be looking at more is the effect of COVID. And I'm sure other documents will be coming back to us to see how we have to adapt moving forward. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to second this. Thank you, Councillor Warwick. So I'd like to go back to Councillor Butlin to sum up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome the different comments. Uh, for Keith, uh, I'm, I must point out risk profiles are it's something that's assessed on an ongoing basis. Uh, and we've always kind of quantified our risk as best we can. We always do risk assessments. Uh, in turn, Jerry, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you're happy that uh, the ethical uh, elements of the investments is in, included in there. But I must point out in terms of uh, the quantifying those risks, it is as a caveat in one point, uh, 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 3.1, and it reads, however, primary considerations will remain security, liquidity, and yield. And we're very keen to make, make sure that Sir Warwickshire County Council continues to be a uh, well-run and financially sound organisation and these policies are basically there to underline that commitment. So uh, I, on that point I would like to kind of move for approval. Thank you very much Councillor Butlin and we'll now go to the vote. Thank, Thank you Chair. So could I invite anyone voting against the six registrations to put their hands up now? Any abstentions? We have one abstention, so the votes and recommendations are carried. Thank you, councillors. Thank you very much. Uh, now we we'll go to item number eight, which is about the Capital Investment Fund and a Warwick uh, Town Centre transport package. And I'd like to ask Councillor Peter Butlin to move the recommendation again. Peter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm pleased to be able to bring this forward. This is something that started at my time when I was a transport portfolio holder. And um, uh, this is a, a kind of a, uh, to uh, put 4.0 or six millions from the capital investment fund and plus a further 0.373 million from the self contributions towards the town warwick town centre transport package um, you'll see in the paper all the different elements of this package and trying to kind of kind of create a good environment for the uh, warwick uh, town which i must point out was designed and built at a time when horse and cart was prevalent and we've been doing our best to make uh, Warwick uh, still relevant and able to cope with the different uh, uh, strains and that uh, modern traffic creates. Um, I must also refer to one of the speakers from yeah, yeah. the beginning, who was very keen to kind of uh, emphasise that she was pleased to see more uh, possibilities for uh, cycling into Warwick. And uh, this uh, also forms a part of this investment in Warwick. Um, so, uh, and also must point out, just as a little caveat on cycle, commitment to cycle routes, we are at the moment progressing 22 different cycle routes across Warwickshire. And uh, we're, I'm also looking, I've asked them to kind of put together a, a map of cycle routes and prospective mass cycle routes that we're progressing over the next few years that everybody can see what our commitment is. But um, <clears throat> this is a, I must also commend and congratulate the council uh, members for Warwick, who have been involved heavily in in, the, in progressing this this uh, uh, scheme for, for Warwick and transport. So uh, uh, they have all been in heavily involved, and a, a great deal of commitment has put into it. I must also congratulate the officer who 
kind of started this several years ago uh, in terms of Margaret Smith, and she's done a sterling job and kind of basically can bring in all the different part, uh, areas of Warwick and organisations to get a commitment to the scheme. So uh, on that basis, uh, I'd like to commend me to the council and also willing to take questions. Thank you, Peter. Do we have a seconder? Commander? Yes, Chair, thank you. Councillor Birdie. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to place on record my uh, thanks to my predecessor, Angela Warner, and the fellow Warwick County Councillors, uh, Councillor Holland Hopkins, uh, working with the officers and the community stakeholders of Warwick to agree a comprehensive plan for Warwick Town Centre. Um, progress of scheme has been a little slow due to funding allocation and proposed funding to complete the plan is most welcome. I would like to thank the Warwick County Council members and officers for agreeing to fund and deliver this final phase. The scheme objectives of improving air quality, support local economy, promote healthier and active community, and protect the historic uh, built environment are, are, are the ones we all agree with. All Warwick Town Councillors will continue to work together to deliver these objectives. I'm extremely pleased to second the proposal. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe we have uh, Councillor Holland would like to speak. John. Yes, uh, Chair, it seems that uh, complete agreement has broken out and I support the proposal from Councillor Buckley seconded by Councillor Birdie. I think this is probably the most consulted on project that the County Council has ever had. And I, I suspect, in fact, going back from before the time when people had horses and carts, when they just had to walk. But, uh, so. Having been so consulted and the public so involved and our stakeholders, I think is the key to this, that we have included everybody's comments and suggestions wherever we possibly could. And the scheme has actually been on the County Council website for the last four years and being totally transparent and doing everything we can to include everybody's comments, I think has led us to this point where, where we are in complete agreement. Mm -hmm. The um, report does point out that um, the benefit cost ratio is more than five to one, nearest to the benefits are nearer six times the cost. And that's quite uh, astonishing. And I wish all public sector projects could achieve that. And right at the end, the evaluation from a corporate board on the basis of uh, social and environmental issues, and of course social meaning um, healthy transport, environmental uh, climate change. So this project really does hit a, a lot of targets. I, I was pleased as uh, Councillor Butler said that our, our public speaker, Sally, uh, link this project to the Stokes Island scheme, which is very much designed to work with the town centre scheme. And Stokes will give us a safe pedestrian and cycle route across the A46 and then towards town centre. And um, I, I'm just pleased that we've got to this point. One, one final uh, tribute. Um, I said that we've had a lot of consultation and, and a key one was a public inquiry in 1993 where Warwick Town Council and Warwick Society retained the services of a planning consultant, Peter Storey. And uh, as a result of his work, we've had uh, developer funding for all of the works we've done up until this point. And uh, sadly, Peter Storey... Uh, if you've been muted, he's been muted, John, hasn't he? So... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, he did it himself or not, I don't know. But, uh, well, John, can you hear me? I do seem to have been muted. So I was, uh, Chair, I, was I, just winding, I was just winding up by paying tribute to a planning consultant, Peter Storey, who uh, over, over 20 years ago appeared at a public inquiry on behalf of Warwick Town Council and the Warwick Society, and he secured developer funding uh, for all of the town centre work which we've done up until this point. And the planning inspectors report in 1994 said development could only go ahead with no increase in traffic in the town centre because of the medieval street pattern. And um, one very final point, 
uh, we have an air quality management zone order in place on Warwick Town Centre and this scheme is intended to leave that order to be in revoked. We all want to see that day. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Yes, I can remember addressing a public meeting in Warwick about the Warwick Town Centre transport plan. So it's been about 15 years ago. So it's been going on for quite a long time and I'm hoping that it's going to eventually coming to the end. Uh, do I have any more speakers? Councillor Condacore. Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Although I live in the Neaton, I probably cycle through Warwick more than most county councillors. And the work that's done already and the work going to be done are really positive. Um, one thing I always ask for, though, is we make sure we've got plenty of little bits in the budget for snagging. Because when we do these projects, we always find there's a missing drop curb or there's little things that need tweaking that people haven't picked out on the high level plans. And I mean, at the moment, if you go out of Barrick Street car park as a cyclist, um, you end up getting taken left or right. You can't actually find a route to go on to head north towards Nuneaton. So uh, massively in favour of this, but we do need to actually get the, the drop curbs and the little bits that mean you can do those merging on and merging off to go by. So um, it'd be great if it happens. And also, we need to use this as a model for all the other towns in Warwickshire, big and small, so they can see the improvements and actually rather than have a backlash against these schemes, actually, in the end of the day, people say, oh, actually, Warwick so much nicer for me. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I have no other speakers that are indicated. So, and Councillor Parmender Singh Birdie uh, has already spoken. So I'd like to ask uh, Peter Butlin to sum up. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for all the comments. Uh, Kind of in answer to uh, Keith, in terms of, kind of being able to kind of do the odd little bits of things that are not sometimes always in the design, there is a healthy contingency attached to this funding. So I'm pretty sure anything that kind of props up that we need to kind of add to it to make it work properly, uh, the funding will be there in, in terms of that contingency. Um, I also point out that um, we have a, a kind of a responsibility to Warwick. It's, a, it's one of our historic towns. There's a lot of historic sites, and it's also, as a result, uh, a, 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 a um, um, tourist attraction. So uh, by doing this, we kind of it will hopefully kind of preserve those historic interests that we've got in the in in Warwick, and also maintain it such that people will still want to come to Warwick. So on the basis of like, I could like move for approval, please. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the vote. Thank you, Chair. So if I could ask if there are any votes against accepting the recommendations? Any abstentions? In which case the vote is carried. Thank you very much. We now come to item nine on the agenda, which it's about historic bridge uh, maintenance, and I'd like to ask uh, Councillor Joe Barker to propose it, Re move the recommendation, I mean. Thank so. you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I have great delight in uh, introducing this report and proposing it. It's already been to Cabinet. Um, item 9, the Historic Bridge Maintenance Programme. If any of you want to consult your papers, page 119. And uh, I'll just have a whistle stop tour through. You may be able to see in the picture behind me um, one of the historic bridges, which is on the list to be uh, repaired. And I'm delighted that that'll be the case. I can actually see Honington Bridge from my house. So I suppose I'm kind of declaring an interest here. Um, but during flood times, the, that bridge, um, the water reaches the arches and I've seen entire trees and enormous gas canisters hitting it. And that is quite an important bridge link um, in our local rural community. Um, I major on that one because that's the one I'm the keenest on and I got very overexcited that a grade one listed bridge was on this list. But there are another um, seven on the, on the list um, uh, all across the county. Um, and they are significantly deteriorating in terms of stonework. And any work that has to be done to them um, as emergencies obviously costs considerably more. So 
the council is already in receipt of a total of £6.3 million to do these repairs, which will be t- done between, well, 2020 this year and 2023, um, and to keep um, them in good order. And the cost-benefit analysis for Councillor Holland particularly um, would demonstrate that it's cheaper to do it this way than to let them deteriorate any further at all. So... Uh, with no further ado, um, I want to move that the report. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a second? Uh, I'm happy to second that uh, and reserve my right to speak. Thank you, Councillor Cargill. Do we have any speakers on this sub- on this subject? Parminda. Uh, yes, uh, Parminda Singh Birdie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I mean, the inclusion of the Castle Bridge is most welcome, and it's probably the most photographed bridge. Uh, at the Warwick Castle, so thank you for that. Look forward to work being done. Thank you. Right, uh, I don't think I see any more speakers on this topic, so I'd like. Oh no, Mike Brain, Councillor Mike Brain, sorry, Mike, over to you. I can't get my camera up. This is wonderful news for Warwickshire Ancient Bridges, which two important bridges are in my division, namely Bidford on Avon and Binton Bridges. Just a uh, those people interested, Bidford Bridge was built in 15th century by local monks using stone from Bordesley Affey after it being demolished by Henry VIII at the time of the dissolution. It was built on the site of the original Roman fort as far to Rickfield Street. It was to be demolished again 100 years later by Charles I to protect his retreating army after the Civil War battle at Worcester. It was rebuilt again in 1650. Some 365 years later, it would be demolished again on the 9th of June, 15, by an agricultural sprayer, which closed it for several months, or was being rebuilt under the leadership of a very capable Warwickshire County Council officer, Richard Roberts, who is still very much involved in delivering the future maintenance programme. Thank you, Richard, for doing the spray. Binton Bridges dates back to the 13th century, even older, and was rebuilt during 1783 and 1884. Both bridges were regularly crossed by William Shakespeare. Not to outdo you, Joe Barker, but my bridges are older than yours. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right, on that. Just, just as a little story, once upon a time, Shakespeare and many band of Shakespeare Stratford locals tried to eat drink did for drinking club. Well, I had the bard fell asleep under a tree next to the river. I don't think the bridge was um, crossable at that time. When prevailed upon to rejoin the drinking session the next morning, he refused in suitably dramatic fashion, saying, No, I've drunk with Piping Pebworth, Dancing Marston, Haunt, Haunted Ilbra, Hungry Grafton, Dodging Exel, Happy Switzerland, Begley Broom, and Drunken Bifford. And so, presumably, I will drink no more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. I thought you might uh, be interested in that bit of history. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very interesting. Just goes through what a very ancient place we live in. Um, I've got Councillor Second wants to speak next. Councillor Second. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mike, for that lovely little history. It was delightful. Um, started, of course, with the, the problems that poor Brid- Bidford Bridge faced um, a few years ago when um, attacked by a spraying machine on the back of a farmer's tractor. Very dangerous people, farmers, I think, so (laughs) we need to be very wary of them. Um, However, I I do, I wanted to, uh, uh, Joe, our bridge between Huntington and my part of the world, it is the gem and I think has has got some particular um, sort of stones on the top which have had to have uh, chips in them because they keep getting taken. So uh, we're really pleased that this money is coming to the bridge. But I actually raised my hand to speak about Clopton Bridge because this this is a bridge that has come up so, so many times in many cases, uh, uh, cabinets and council uh, for funding to support it. it. It suffers rather badly from the odd truck going across it who tends to just get it wrong and hit the corner on the way in 
but it is a wonderful bridge. It's it's uh, been there for so many years. Uh, it's had all the benefit of historic medieval traffic, and now it has the benefit of modern day 21st century traffic, and it needs to be made manageable to cope with it. We've always been a bit worried, and now at last, money is coming in to support this bridge. So good news all around. Um, it's a great, uh, great announcement for investment across all of Warwickshire, and I think we should be really congratulating officers who have managed to achieve this fund. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, you're muted. Sorry, uh, thank you. So I'd like to invite Councillor Heather Timms to speak. Sorry about that. Yes, I, likewise with the other speakers, I'm really pleased that the, well, over half a million is to be spent on Bretford Bridge. I have spent a lot of time sitting at the traffic lights because it is a one-way system on this bridge, um, looking through the stonework to the river be, be below. So all of those men, holes to be mended and repaired will be an absolute treat. I don't. I think the residents of Bretford might like it that the bridge is closed at certain points because this is a very, very busy route uh, for, the, for the Foss Way uh, between Rugby and uh, uh, Coventry. So it's uh, going to be an interesting time, but really looking forward to the completion of these works. Long overdue, and it's really great that it's all going to be repaired. Thank you. Very good. Well, I think uh, I have no other uh, people indicating to speak, so I'll go back to the second, uh, Councillor Mark Cargill. Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. And again, congratulations to you and Peter. I have forgot to say that. Um, I first of all, I have to say... Well, I, I think, forgive you. <laughs> I, I think I'm correct in saying that um, it was during some storm some years ago that uh, a number of bridges around the country were actually damaged during the flooding, and the, uh, the exec thought... I think we need to put some money forward for repairing our historic bridges and well done for doing that. It was preempting uh, a situation and, uh, and bringing forward funds at the right time for, for our bridges. OK, I live in Ulster. We've got two historic bridges. Uh, sadly, they they can't compare to Mike and, and Joe's. They're only a couple of hundred years old. Minor things. You'll see the one behind me at the moment, and that is my back garden as well. So, Joe, we, we have a, a swing in common there, a bridge each. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say also that the Historic Bridges team are excited about this funding and actually preempted a little bit this, uh, this announcement today following the, the, uh, the budget announcement. Uh, so you can tell how excited they are about keeping our bridges in perfect order uh, for another 300 years or longer in Mike's case. And I'm sure Mike can remember when they were built. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I didn't mean that. Thank you very much indeed. I do second this. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to ask Councillor Joe Barker to sum up. Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, mine's the only grade one listed one. That's that's what I'm going to say. And that's why I think that my bridge trumps the others, because we have been paying top trumps with our bridges. Um, I want to congratulate the officers and the executive for for being so speedy in thinking, ah, oh, well, bridges are collapsing. We've got a load of historic bridges. There's bound to be a fund for this. Let's apply for it. And lo and behold, we've got £6.3 million. Pounds. Absolutely fantastic. And I don't think that there is anybody who will mind the odd closure to keep these bridges going for just that little bit longer. Um, so I, I'm absolutely delighted to move the paper and the recommendation to council. So we go ahead with this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so we'll now go to the vote. Monica. Thank you, Chair. Are there any votes against? Any abstentions? So that's unanimously voted through. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> congratulations, Jeff. Anyway, so we now go on to item number 10, which is the rail strategy. And I'd like to ask Peter Butlin to uh, move the recommendation. Peter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in the absence of uh, Councillor Clark, I've been asked to kind of present this paper. Um, 
it came to the realization that uh, our existing rail strategy was no longer fit for purpose in the way in which the railways were being run at the moment and we went to consultation uh, to uh, basically kind of see where we can re um, create new policies or adjust their existing strategy. Uh, it was an extensive uh, consultation as is kind of itemized in all the papers and it shows who we spoke to and what kind of came back and, uh, and, 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 and how we reflect those kind of commitments from other people in, into the new strategy. Uh, the main themes that came back from that consultation were access, ticketing, improved experience on our stations, new stations, uh, linked to all modes of transport, and devolution are pretty well sums up the way the things that came back that we've come now put into our new strategy. The omissions from this, and one or two people have already kind of pointed out this, is that uh, we were awaiting the uh, results from the uh, Williams review, uh, which was looking at the way in which the railways was organised and kind of brought forward. And also, uh, what also has overtaken events is the COVID thing. Uh, the result of which is most of the uh, um, franchises have actually been kind of more or less closed down and been kind of run directly or financed directly from government because they've gone from uh, down to about 20 to 25 percent of their normal uh, customer base. Uh, as a result, none of the kind of franchises on that basis could financially function. So the government has taken over in that respect. Um, I was at a recent meeting uh, where we was had a report back in terms of what, what the government was looking towards doing um, and the indications are that the franchise aspect of the railways will be abandoned in the favour of an independent organising body uh, uh, to oversee the whole of the railway network and, uh, and the franchise is abandoned in favour for public service contracts. So the, the existing franchise companies will be kind of contractors to the delivery of our railway services. Um, we're, not, we're still waiting the white paper, that is not definite, but that is what was kind of coming our way when we, I did this LTF meeting. Now, once we know these policies that are coming back from government in the way, which is uh, uh, going to be organised, then policies then will be put into our new uh, railway strategy. And on that basis, um, uh, I would, I, we have always had a commitment in Warwickshire to build more railway stations. And uh, I kind of always pray to the fact that I was involved with three of them. And um, with the, there is continued uh, commitment to kind of get more railway uh, services into Warwickshire. Um, and also, the uh, uh, so on that basis, I'm willing to take questions and move for approval. <clears throat> Do we have a seconder? Yes, uh, Chairman. Councillor Shilton. Can't see me photograph in the US, so the camera must be off somewhere along the line. Um, I'm, I, 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 uh, I'm honoured to actually second uh, the proposal. I reserve my right. Thank you, Councillor Shilton. Uh, I've got a list of speakers on this. We start off with Councillor Dave Parsons. Dave. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Off you go. Um, the, um, the, sorry, our rail strategy, it's not terribly con contentious, but um, I would also question its ambition a little bit. Um, one of the things that did strike me in some of the sessions I visited, so particularly in the north, um, the capacity issue uh, very much hung on uh, the fact that HS2 would uh, would have to come in and, and uh, very much be part of this strategy. And I know that as a, as a uh, council, we're opposed to HS2. We have to accept that it, it's uh, going to arrive in many shapes and forms. Um, I mean, certainly we in my part of the world were hoping for a station at Polesworth, which is mentioned. Um, but um, not not terribly strongly. So uh, yes, I indeed support the strategy, but feel that we're possibly missing an opportunity here to be a little uh, well. We could be a little more ambitious and be looking for a, a slightly stronger policy. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next on the list is Councillor John Horner. John. 
Thank you, Chairman. First of all, uh, congratulations on your election and also the Deputy Chairman, and uh, thank you to the previous Chairman. Um, regarding the, the agenda, the, uh, the strategy, it occurred to me that um, COVID, of course, has happened since this strategy was endorsed and with the various in, uh, financial incentives issued by the Conservative government, I'm wondering if, in, in some respects, echoing uh, the previous speaker, that uh, we shouldn't be a bit more ambitious. Um, my interest, coming from where I am, is the importance of tourism to Stratford Town and the importance of a link to London, an effective link. and. It says in the report that uh, that could be improved with some engineering works, and it's true. Um, a passing loop at Claverdon Station with a, with a station there would actually double the frequency of trains on the leamington Clavingdon line and allow direct trains more frequently from London. Um, and it is this attraction of the tourists in, in the London area coming up to Stratford via, via no doubt, Bicester, which... Uh, will be very valuable in, as we rebuild from COVID. And therefore, I would beg the, uh, the authors of this report to reconsider. And perhaps as a result of the COVID financial uh, stimulus, to act a bit more ambitious. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Jerry Roodhouse. Jerry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just a couple of points. Yeah, I mean, broadly uh, agree with the strategy. I would echo the last comments about ambition, read COVID and coming out, uh, and perhaps it needs a reread and a read through to uh, look at the ambition against what uh, Grant Shapps and others are saying um, about going forward. Um, the other particular area, um, of course, I would welcome Rugby Parkway sooner rather than later. Um, but, uh, you know, it's good to see that in there. But linking to that is the links actually for public transport, um, cycleways, cycle, you know, cycle parking to, to actually try and move some of that modal shift um, uh, away. Uh, and I've noticed now, of course, they want to try these e-bike e thing, uh, e-bikes uh, as well. So I think we've got to try and uh, think about actually getting people to the stations and away from the stations um, as well. And, and making that uh, interconnection so it's, it, it is integrated and then of course the last bit is, is really around ticket integration and um, so you can actually just travel around uh, more easily with buses and public transport and as we've seen with uh, some of our bus contractors going around they don't exactly uh, follow all the rules so I think we need a bit more ambition if we can because of Covid but also I'd like to see a bit more work done around the public transport, the linkages uh, in and out to actually get real modal shift in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. The next speaker is Councillor Keith Kandaka. Thank you very much, Chair. This is a really important strategy and it's really disappointing that I have to vote against it. There is so much good stuff in here. We have a seven platform station in Eton. We could have a lot more trains post HS2 stopping on the West Coast Main Line. Unfortunately, we won't. Um, the, the, the train service will stop at Litchfield for the extra peak services because HS2 comes in just north of Litchfield. And it seems to have been decided by the DFT at the moment that we actually will have the Manchester stopping services not actually stopping the neat. So there's a lot of ambition that needs to be put in to get us stops on the main line. On the services from Coventry to Leicester that envisaged, that's expected to bypass the neat station. We're a diver. And this is why the crazy idea of the Neaton Parkway has been created. No one has asked for a parking station for the Neaton. And if they did, it wouldn't be on the 85 by Godwell's. This is a location that's actually in Leicestershire, has no cycling route, no walking route, no bus service. It is the most inaccessible point to build a parkway station you can. And what railways do is they have local services that stop every one or two miles, and they have long distance services that only want to stop every 10 or 20 miles. And to stop a service involves a time penalty. Every service at Warwick Parkway diminishes the chances of a service at Warwick Town Centre. 
a parkway station between Dunedin and Hinkley will be a disaster for rail companies wanting to serve my town of Nuneaton and also serving Hinkley. We need to con concentrate as much stuff on our existing stations as possible and build stations like Stocking Ford that have got a massive walking catchment and cycling and bus catchment into Stocking Ford Station. The business case for Stocking Ford Station is absolutely stupendously marvellous because it is embedded in an area that needs that station. And people, including Bill Owner, have been talking about the station for decades and it needs to happen, Stocking Ford. The Parkway Station is going to detract from the services we get in the Neaton. The aspiration for it is only as a SOP to actually the Leicester, the Coventry, Nottingham services bypassing our town. And I will strongly oppose a parkway station built somewhere we is not in walking, cycling and bus distance of populations. There is other good stuff in here. Obviously, an entrance on the Wellington side of the Neaton station will be transformative to the people coming into the Neaton station. So in voting against this, it is only because of that parkway proposal I'm voting against it. I wish all the other projects well. I know how hard our, our staff work in a very difficult and complicated situation of the railways. Um, but we, are, we need integrated transport. And that means all the trains through Nuneaton need to stop at the same station, the Trent Valley station, and then serve local stations in the suburbs. Thank you, Chair. Keeps going off. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Councillor Claire Golby. So, Claire. Okay, muted. It keeps muting itself, but I, I think she heard me there. I did. Okay, okay well done. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I take the opposing view to the one that's just gone before me, where I will support this because of the good stuff that's in there, and I will deal with the stuff that I don't necessarily agree with at a later date. Um, I, I am very, very supportive of a station in Stocking Ford because it has a very positive effect on, uh, on my area. I know there's a lot of people who um, I represent that work in Birmingham and for them not to have to go into the town centre to get a train to Birmingham would be a godsend on uh, a Monday to Friday. And um, we've already got a direct link to Coventry from Bermuda Park Station, which is also in the area that I represent. And um, I would also strongly support getting a move on with, with the Stocking Ford Station as quickly as we can possibly move on that. Um, it has been talked about for quite some you're on you're muted no, yeah. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> did you get any of that yeah it was only off for, for, for a few seconds oh, okay i don't know what happened there somebody must be uh pressing buttons so uh yeah i would like to um support the the speed speeding up of getting stock in ford station off the ground as you know we we have been talking about this for quite some time. It would be in an area where transport is an issue and not everybody has access to a vehicle. So, again, it would help different um, different demographics uh, expand their uh, horizons for employment. And I, for one, know that that's, that's critical at the moment. Um, and Weddington Terrace is an absolute must. Again, we've been talking about it for quite some time. It would it would benefit the, the transport um, element in the town centre. So, again, people wouldn't have to come over the railway bridge to get into town to drop off and pick up. It is relatively small changes that would make a big impact. So, despite other issues that I may not agree with, like I said, I would, I will deal with the issues that I don't agree with on a case-by-case -case basis, but I will actually be voting in favour of this transport strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Neil Durbix to speak. Neil. Thank you. Um, I think we have to remember that this is a, a high-level strategy. 
and that it's it's not necessarily appropriate to um, talk about all of the developments that are behind this. Um, however, um, yeah, I, I do hope that a lot of these projects can be moved forward, notwithstanding the uh, the, the post COVID climate, which we are going to see. Um, we've we've got a lot in here. We've heard a lot about um, new stations and so on. But I think that one of the things that is really important to the people of, of Warwickshire is to have good access to the stations that we've got. We have a particular problem in Atherston that we had our footbridge removed. We need a replacement. There's no way that you can get to the uh, one of the platforms when it rains because it floods. The um, disabled access is a joke. It's really non-existent. And these are things that are behind this plan that we really need to push forwards. Uh, Atherston has the highest uh, percentage rise in passenger numbers in the whole of the county, 79% since 2012. It's there in the documents. And I think we must um, trust our officers to come forward and deliver some of these other projects that aren't mentioned in here. But I think that we, we all need to be aware that this is a very complex problem. You know, we talk about connectivity. Somewhere like Atherston is a wonderful place to connect to the A5 and to, to uh, services from there. We have huge um, developments commercially that use the rail link for a lot of their, their workers. So although I think that um, some things should be mentioned in a stronger way in this, we've got to start somewhere and I think that this is a good way to start. So you know, I, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Jill Simpson-Vince. So, Jill. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I, I'm welcoming this strategy because it does include Rugby Parkway Station again. Um, the pressure on Rugby Main Station has been growing and growing and we kind of need that release valve of Rugby Parkway. Um, it would be situated near Holton. Holton currently has seven different developers building over there so the need is definitely going to be there um, as rugby is continuing to expand so the more pressure we can take off the station in the centre of town and release some of that pressure through the rugby parkway is just brilliant and we just need to make sure it all happens thank you thank you Jill uh, the next speaker is Councillor uh, Yusuf Darmash Yusuf. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Like most members, I also welcome the strategy, but there are two issues I'd like to briefly raise. The first is the improvements around Rugby Station to help with the present access and regress issues. They are some relatively simple improvements that can be made, and I have raised this issue in Council previously, as has Councillor Webb, and they are listed in the report. These involve simply moving the two bus stops that are near to the station on Murray Road, doing that would greatly ease the queuing and congestion around the station at peak times and I know there are plans to do so, I've seen them, but nothing's happened yet. So it'd be good to get some assurances assurances that this would happen as soon as possible. Uh, the second issue involves the Parkway station, which other members have mentioned, which would, will, be sited in the area that I represent. I know that residents in Holton and many in Holton will welcome the council's continued commitment to provide it and I'm personally supportive of the project, but as part of the plans, I do want to see a piece of work undertaken to evaluate the potential impact of the station on traffic levels on the local road network in Hillmorton. If that work does show an impact, then I would want some mitigation put in place as part of the wider project. I suspect that would be most likely on the A428, Crick Road and High Street. I would really welcome some assurances about both of these issues from Councillor Butlin on behalf of Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, the next speaker I've got is Councillor Maggie O'Rourke. Maggie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
like some of the previous speakers, I am I do welcome it, and I thank the officers for all the hard work that they've actually sort of put into generating this report and strategy. Um, the uh, the stuff with the parkway in rugby, uh, as some of you will remember, I have raised this several times, and as I noticed the motion both at county and borough in the past when we first lost out in terms of the funding options at national level. Um, I know we did have our LEP on board at the time and the county council, but uh, funds were limited at national level. We all know that Ruby is the fastest growing town in the whole of the West Midlands and it really is a commuter town. Um, I uh, I hear what um, uh, previous councillors said about uh, Hill Morton end of the but I cover a ward in the centre of town, uh, which runs a small single road called Murray Road straight down to the main station. And to be quite honest with you, the air quality is absolutely appalling down there and it's just not fit for purpose. And I have also asked for, bus, for the bus stops to be moved and nothing's happened. And local people, quite frankly, are sick and tired of it. And the idling traffic down there is causing really, really bad problems in terms of air quality and affecting the residents that I actually represent. So I really would like the sort of partway to happen as soon as possible because Ruby Station is just about at capacity, although I suppose with all this home working, things might actually look a bit different. And I wonder if any thoughts have been given to that in terms of how the new world of COVID might look as well, because there might be some areas like rugby that could be pushed forward because obviously our capacity needs are greater than others. But in general terms, I welcome the report and thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, the next speaker is Councillor Bob Stevens. Bob. Uh, Bob, your speaker is off. You're on mute. Right. That's How's it? it? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Listening, listening to this debate, I'm, I'm reminded of um, Dr. Beeching, and I think we're sort of in danger of reversing a lot of what he already did. Um, as, a, as, a, as a strategy, it's, it's quite good, but it's sort of unambitious, and I agree with a lot with what Councillor Parsons said, that... Um, basically it doesn't take into account the um, effect of HS2, uh, the two-track high-speed rail that's going to run right through the, the, the county. And we are, whether we like it or not, we are going to be encouraged to have trains going towards the West Midlands and Birmingham. And I'm not sure that this uh, accounts for the flow of Warwickshire possibly becoming a dormitory area for the West Midlands. I don't know. Watch this space. Um, I think the other thing that came out is coming out very clearly is the need for an integrated transport policy. It's all very well having a road trans uh, policy, a rail policy, a cycling policy, but if they don't join together, uh, it, 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 it can clash and, and I don't think it achieves anything. So I think we, we've got to watch that. I take the point that uh, Councillor Horner made, and this is more from the south of the region, is the fact that... Um, Nowhere does it seem to improve transport to London. And some of the trains to London are fright frighteningly crowded, frighteningly full. Uh, the Chiltern line, we're very lucky, I think, is a very efficient little line, but um, it could, could be improved as well. So I think we need to look into that a bit more. Um, so I, uh, basically, I am going to support it. I'm going to take the attitude of Claire, Claire Golby, who, who actually said very much, yeah, I'll support it and change it from within. Uh, because the council needs a policy that I think we've got to be integrated. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. The next speaker is uh, Councillor Alan Webb. Alan. Thank you, Chairman, and congratulations on your uh, appointment. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful year, and of course, to your predecessor and to your deputy. Um, I hope you can hear me okay, and I hope you can see me okay, because I've I don't often yeah. come in like this and uh, right. you know, make sure I've got the buttons right. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit to the, the thing about uh, Rugby Main Station, which has already been said by many people. Um, but until such time as it becomes supremely attractive for people to want to get to that station when on their daily commute or whatever, uh, without getting there by car, uh, in this case I'm on, on Keith Kondaka's side, um, then our problems down in that particular division are going to get worse and worse. I'm not completely convinced, sadly, that the uh, Holton Parkway 
plan will actually add to that because we're getting to the West Coast Main Line services. People from there, as Councillor Damash has said, uh, will still be finding ways to get down to Rugby Station to pick up their line. Great work to go on in there, but it needs to be got right. So whilst I'm not going to vote against this report or speak against it, I think we need to be mindful until such time as it becomes extremely financially and time-wise attractive for people to be able to get on trains at Rugby Main, uh, West Coast Main Line Station there without arriving by car, then you're going to find resistance. You certainly will. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, we have no other speakers indicating, so I go to the second to now, Councillor uh, Dave Shilton. Dave. Yes, thank you, Chairman. And I should have said, welcome to the ancient order of the chain gang. I'm <laughs> sure you'll enjoy it. Thank you, Dave. Um, Chair, I've heard a lot of this conversation now and the people speaking a lot of it is outside of the strategy it's the road networks around that strategy around the stations which should be addressed by our engineers and i'm sure that will be taken on board if not then the councillor should get in touch with the relevant portfolio the jeff clark to ask him to get that to taken up regarding the strategy itself it's a way forward again i remember 20 odd years ago uh, well, 25 years ago, I suppose, 24 uh, years ago, when I became a councillor. The first thing I spoke about was the rail station for Kenilworth. It took 20 years after that, and we've now got a railway station. So things don't happen overnight. The one good news in this strategy for me, where I live, is the twin tracking proposals between Leamington and Kenilworth and through to Coventry and Nuneaton which is going to provide a better service right the way through and hopefully link up so trains can get caught to Leicester and the way out there. There's a lot in this strategy which is good and I'm sure we can keep talking to uh, the rail people to get these things as we need them. They did listen, we are, we've met them already as you know at uh, the community's uh, scrutiny and uh, they were very useful and, and very helpful in their, their deliberations on which way they wanted to go. So I think it is a strategy, it's in the right place. It needs to be worked on, no doubt about that, all strategies do. But I'm sure that to vote this through today is the right direction for this county council. I really do. Not only that, of course, mm. in Kenilworth, we're talking about transport getting to the university and the buses. We've now got proposals for the Common City Stadium coming there. Now, if it does, We've got a chance of getting a railway station straight into the, or a railway line, straight into the university, which is going to help the environmental aspects of the area. So hopefully all those things will take place. But let's keep talking. Let's adopt the strategy it is and then add to it as we go along with the meetings which will take place. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, Councillor Peter Butlin to move the recommendation. Peter. Uh, thank you, Chair. There's a whole load of different uh, commentators on this, but I'm trying to divide it up into about three or four different subjects. Uh, the first one was ambition. Um, I personally think uh, the ambition lies around the fact, well, once we know where the government is going, and they're uh, especially on devolution because i'm very keen on devolution because that gives us locally power once you've got a bit of power in terms of uh, what you basically kind of construct and do locally uh, then you can basically kind of, kind of uh, engage with those ambitions that we've got already have had anyway uh, hs2 uh, the policy was construct uh, put together to take it into account and assuming that hs2 would go ahead so that's already into that strategy um, <clears throat> the uh, devolution as i pointed out will also en en enable us to have those ambitions uh, and then it comes on to specifics in terms of various stations um, uh, in the north they were talking of stockingford and polesworth um, that was held back in terms of progressing that was because of the franchise system uh, because there was different franchises on different lines uh, and it held back because we couldn't make the kind of business cases. Uh, if the government it goes in the direction that I think it's going to go in terms of uh, uh, um, 
uh, contracts, uh, delivery contracts in terms of railways, then we, we have got a possibility then to make the case for Polesworth and Stockingford stations. <coughs> Uh, and Keith kind of talks about the uh, non-eaten parkway station. I think we're kind of, uh, I think I'll put that to one side and kind of have a kind of separate conversations with Keith over that one because there's a lots of conflicting things because the main concern there was about getting a direct line from Coventry through to Leicester. Uh, it would not affect or denigrate uh, the existing services in non-eaten because they're pretty good anyway. <coughs> Um, Rugby Parkway Station, something that's close to my heart because it's uh, on my doorstep, um, uh, that has been progressing well and we're pro uh, putting together a meeting uh, uh, for uh, uh, where we've got to and uh, kind of to address all the different issues that uh, the local councillors have got in terms of the progress we're making there. So that is progressing well. It's one of the few things that kind of it is progressing. And as someone has pointed out, there is an unknown capacity. I think it was Maggie. Um, Post-COVID, we do not know what the capacity requirement for the railways is going to be. Uh, and until we know that in terms of where we're going in terms of capacity, because prior to that, we was expanding at the rate of 6% a year. There was capacity problems, uh, train such shortages, etc. Uh, Post-COVID, with people working from home, etc., it is going to affect the number of people who use our railways. So uh, we need that information uh, and uh, data that will uh, influence the way in which we kind of construct our strategy going forward. So there is as much about what's not in the strategy, which we are aware of, which we'll be putting at a later date as to what is in the strategy. So uh, on that, I hopefully have answered most of the questions that have been brought up. Um, but mark my words, Warwickshire has always been ambitious about its requirements for the railways uh, in Warwickshire and better connectivity. Uh, so uh, on that basis, I'd like to kind of... Uh, move this for approval and uh, seek your approval. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. I'll now ask Monica to go, as we go to the vote, to add up. Thank you, Chairman. So are the votes against the motion? I see one hand only. Any abstentions? One abstention, one abstention. And, and so the vote is carried and the rail strategy is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Well, I think we're going to break for lunch now, and I believe the idea is we will break for half an hour. So what I'd like you all to do is to sign off from this meeting, come out of this meeting, and come back in again in uh, come back in again at two o'clock, actually, two o'clock. So if we could ask everybody not to forget to do that, then we'll see you at two o'clock. Thank you very much.
everybody and welcome to part two of the uh, our AGM. Uh, one of the first things I have to do this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of you all to um, present this to the retiring chairman or chair. So Nicola, come along and accept this prize of, uh, of our appreciation for all the work that you've done over the past year. <laughs> well deserved, and um, unfortunately, I can't give a kiss on the cheek. But never mind. Life's unkind sometimes, but there you go. Anyway, so uh, that's, 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 thank you, Nicola, again. So we now go on to the uh, sort of surge on with the rest of the committee. And we are now at item number 11 which is the Audit and Standards uh, Annual Report for 2019-20. And I'd, ask, I'd, like, I'd like to ask Councillor Cam Corr to move the recommendation. Cam. Thank you, Chair. Can I say congratulations to you on your new appointment as Chair and also to Peter Gilbert. I'm sure you're going to make a great team in the up and coming year. So um, I'm really excited to see you both. Um, so... <clears throat> the Audit and Standards Committee, um, the recommendation before us is that Council receives the annual report of the Audit and Standards Committee. Um, the work conducted by the Audit and Standards Committee is critical to the oversight and governance of the Council. The themes identified and which were considered through 2019 and 2020 by the Committee and are mentioned on page 2004, not 2004, that would be a big committee paper, um, such as the financial sustainability, service sustainability, transformation and technology are all themes which are integral components <coughs> of delivering services and meeting the demands of the council. Um, and the observations within the report are very welcome, very welcome indeed. Um, Chair, if I may, I'd just like to place my um, thanks on record to the Chairman, John Bridgman, of Audit and Standards for his work and commitment, together also to Grant Thornton, who are the external auditors for both the Council and Warwickshire Local Government Pension Funds, and also, um, finally, our own internal audit team, who have done an amazing amount of work also, and have presented it to the committee, um, and is also um, outlined within the report. So, Chair, if I may, I'd like to hold there. Um, I'm happy to take questions at this moment in time, if there are any, um, but I think I do need a seconder before I carry on. Of course you do. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Mark Cargill, happy to uh, second, thank you. And do you reserve your right to speak? Well, if I may, I'll just say a few words now and then um, move on, if I may, Chair. By all means. Thank you. I'd just like to say, um, first of all, I, I concur with Cam that um, the, the Chair has been a very, very uh, good Chairman. Um, in fact, um, I've actually quite enjoyed his meetings because they are, I use the word swift, they're not fast by any stretch of imagination, but he doesn't hang about. And I think we could all learn a couple of lessons from him, actually, because he does hold a very efficient meeting. Uh, the, <coughs> see, I think Campbell mentioned about Bob um, in a little while, about one of our members there, sadly, missed. Uh, I was interested when Izzy did ask me to go on to audit and standards. I thought, what on earth is it all about? Well, I have found out, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the committee. Uh, it has been varied and um, good uh, a good committee, uh, good members, and some very, very good debate and uh, and uh, questioning of the reports brought forward by the officers, which generally are of a very high quality. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mark. Um, I have uh, Bill Gifford who'd like to speak. Bill. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I would say that John Bridgman is an extremely good chair and uh, um, takes real, <coughs> makes uh, good meetings, they're incredibly well prepared and we do, uh, I've been on audit and standards now for a number of years and I have to say that I, I do feel that we look closely at some of the inner workings of the council 
And one of the fascinations of all of and standards is that we may be looking at um, a, a particular schools. We may be looking at um, adult social care. We may be looking at, at um, s some issues to do with transport. But um, we do we do look at various bits of the council and we have an extremely good internal audit department that um, makes sure that we get good reports. Not always um, positive, but always well thought, thought through, well written. And I think it's a committee which uh, um, does make the best use of its time in order to hold the council to account and uh, I'm very happy to you know, support, support the report which uh, I think shows that yes we're supportive of the council but it's not uncritical to support. Thank you. Thank you Bill. Um, I have no indications from other councillors so I will go to the seconder again Mark. Councillor Cargill. You're on mute, Mark. Apologies. Yeah, I'm very happy to, to second. Thank you. Uh, Cam, I'd like to ask you to, then to sum up. Thank you, Chair. Just to say um, thank you to Bill for his um, words of wisdom, because I know he's been on this um, committee for a considerable amount of time. Um, and just to um, echo um, the words mentioned by Mark, really, regarding um, Bob Meacham, who I'd like to place on record again, my condolences to his family and friends. Um, unfortunately, Bob passed away um, in September last year, and, um, and he too was, you know, was a very committed chair to the Audit and Standards um, Committee as well. So, um, Chair, I'd, I'd like to put, put that on record. But as there are no other questions, Chair, I would like to move the report uh, and the recommendation as printed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so in that case, we will go to the vote. Monica. Can I just draw members' attention to the fact that we are voting on the version which was distributed this morning. So that's the version revised um, 23rd of July. Are there any votes against? No. Any abstentions? No. In which case the um, vote is carried. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. We now come on to item number 12, which is notice of motion. And the first one is a, a motion on the local transport plan. And I'd like to invite uh, Councillor Kondaka to move the motion. Keith. Thank you very much, Chair. And it's very useful to have it on the screen as well. Um, basically, we didn't want to be particularly controversial in this motion, but actually put forward in these five points uh, the things we would like to be in the transport plan going forwards. These transport plans last really long periods, so it is very good to have some broad principles um, when producing a new plan. Um, the first one is really about public transport and active travel. I think the vast majority of people here agree that should be the first choice. The second point is moving towards all our vehicles being low or eventually zero emissions. Uh, and this is happening. It, it, we've not set a time scale in this motion. but We're very keen that the local transport plan is moving us in the direction. Some things like cars um, will move quite quickly. I'm sure electric motorbikes will progress. Some things like the HGVs will take a longer time. But it's very important that our transport plan has that vision and also provides the infrastructure because obviously electric HGVs would need some way of recharging, which might be different to what we have in our home charging points. And we're talking also about new modes of transport that will come up and new mobility innovations. Um, the, the segue has gradually died, um, but there's a lot of new electric scooters, um, light transport, very light transport schemes, lots of stuff coming out of Coventry. And um, we want it all to be integrated. Councillor Stevens talked in the debate 
on the local transport plan about the need to get all our new stations integrated in with all our other transport stuff. And we mustn't forget goods. Yeah, we need a sustainable way for all our goods to be taken to the shops or taken directly to our homes. Uh, we're already seeing this, particularly with the COVID lockdown, a big change in how much is delivered straight to the home, how much supermarket deliveries uh, are taking place now to the home, and what happens about that last mile delivery, and also where they come from. So that's our key thing: is not to forget goods, uh, and we need solutions to be based upon the places they are. Obviously, solutions for Warwick would be different to a rural area, would be different to a more modern town. But the aim should always be to get that reduction in CO2, obviously improvement in air quality and be a positive step. And our final point is we really wanted to be an international leader in all this stuff. Um, today, we have Lotus announcing they're moving some of their R&D to Warwickshire. Um, in stratford Penaven district and there's so much stuff right at the top end right at the day-to-day -day stuff that is being driven by innovation low carbon uh, technology and a lot of the outputs from our universities um, i want to mention one of the residents i saw yesterday he's gone blind um, and he really keeps talking about how he gets around and the issues he has and he said that someone goes blind in the UK every 15 minutes. And a lot of stuff in this local transport plan, the integrated transport, uh, the walking routes, etc. We need even more as we get more people with disabilities. Um, yeah, a blind person is never going to drive. Um, but there's so many other disabilities we, we, we have as we hopefully live longer. So disability needs to be a key factor in all these plans. We've deliberately sort of followed what's coming out of government yeah grant shaps were saying all this stuff very recently and a lot of places are doing it leicester has just um done some new stuff in the last few weeks about their cycle network out of the city of leicester yeah this is all the stuff that's going on and it needs to be rooted at the root of our new transport policy I hope this gets widespread support amongst all the groups. I say it is based upon just the basic things we need to do going forwards. There is no timescales on any of this stuff because obviously people have different views on how fast these things will go. And some of that will also come out in the development of the local plan. So we're not being prescriptive in this um, motion. It is a, a direction of travel rather than a what time will arrive or sometimes how we will get there but it is really really important that we have a world beating transport system that supports the local needs and takes notice of the local circumstances and i hope everyone can actually support this uh, and be constructive um, the local transport plan some people may not know it even exists because it's been such a while ago since we developed the last one uh, and this is a great opportunity to make a um, at not a new start, but embed a lot of the stuff we have been doing in a more formalised way. So, Chair, I commend this and um, I think Jonathan's going to second it and I'll welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, uh, Councillor Chilvers, you're going Thank to second you. this? Yeah, I'll second this and I'll speak now. OK. Um, so, yeah, um, this motion, as, as uh, Councillor Kondak mentioned, is heavily based on uh, Grant Schatz's key goals in his forward to the decarbonising transport paper, which came out in March. Um, so those five points that Keith uh, took you through are, are almost word for word what the Transport Minister Grant Schatz is asking us to do. We've just, with the help of officers, tweaked the bits to make sure that it's directly relevant to Warwickshire, but those were, were very minor tweaks. And so this is absolutely the right time and the right place for us as councillors to be endorsing these goals that Grant Shapps has set out right at the start of the new local transport plan for uh, process. So everyone's agreed that the, the old LTP3 is outdated um, and it needs replacing. And so we're at a stage as an authority now when we're just putting together the issues and options paper at the start of the new process. And as a council, at this point, we're expected to set out a broad direction and principles. 
um, to, to form a framework. Um, and so this isn't, as Keith said, it's not about costing details or specific pro programs like the LTP3 before it. It's a high level policy direction uh, um, uh, document. Um, and so the broad goals Grant Shapp sets out in his forward, which you can Google and have a look at if you want, um, should be like fundamental to our plan. And in that forward, he writes, uh, changes in leadership at a local level will make an important contribution to reducing national greenhouse gas emissions. So he specifically talks about the leadership needed at local level. And so this motion is just an opportunity for us to accept that mantle of leadership in line with and within the direction set out by uh, the government. So I'm hoping in this context, this is the right time for this, it's the right place. I'm hoping it should be a fairly straightforward coming together of us kind of endorsing uh, what central uh, government is saying and in our strategic role as full council. So I commend this motion to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Chilvers. Uh, we've got quite a number of speakers, but before I start, are there any amendments? Yes, there was a Liberal Democrat amendment. Uh, in that case, do you want to uh, introduce it, Jerry? Can do. It should have been previously um, circulated yeah. um, to two members. Um, and I'll speak now if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought it might be. Um, so <laughs> the question around here, looking at the motion, Jonathan's right in the sense that Grant Shapps has set out a, a strategic direction of travel nationally. Um, and, and this motion, the basis of the motion, does that. And it actually starts to. Where I think Grant Shapps and some others have possibly missed, uh, missed out is actually about looking for stronger support around schools and the pick up and drop off and everything else that goes with traffic at that point. And uh, a national campaign called the Living Streets campaign has been on this for a long time, which builds into the healthier community um, because we all recognise that air quality is something that is serious around schools. Uh, and, and therefore, I see this, uh, hopefully, the amendment as something that builds on the direction of travel for the health and well-being of people in the areas and for children. And we should be linking in more with some of the national uh, campaigns that are going on to actually help drive forward a more direction of travel for those communities, but especially, uh, as Keith touched on as well, the point about linking the technology that we've got within Warwickshire to actually to try and link some of that to the local, to actually try and resolve some of these ongoing issues instead of just throwing our hands up and saying, well, that's how it is then. So I hope the amendment is accepted and uh, we, we will, if the amendment is accepted, support the motion. Mm. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rudas. First of all, do we have? Do you have a seconder? Yes, I, I am the seconder, and I would like to speak now, if that's possible. Uh, that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to second this motion. Um, I think, uh, and, I, and obviously support the. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, I'd like to uh, move the amendment and support the motion as a whole. Um, I think many of us have benefited from quieter streets. Um, it's one of, the, one of the benefits, I think, of very few of, of COVID. Actually, there's been a lot less traffic on the road, much improved air quality. Um, and, um, you know, we all want to see this continue. <coughs> Particularly around schools, I think schools suffer enormously from uh, poor air quality because parents are driving their children to school. And what we need is, is stronger localised school um, travel plans to encourage parents not to do that or if they must drive, you know, park five minutes away and walk the last bit so that playgrounds are not overwhelmed by um, by fumes. And this will help create healthy communities um, from children and their and their relations to having much better air quality. I think one of the difficulties has, has been recently, uh, certainly in Leamington, is that Stagecoach have reduced their service, making it harder and harder to actually travel on the bus. You used to be able to get a bus from Lillington, where I am, to walk to the station, which meant that many residents just got on the got on the bus to go to, if they were going on somewhere on a train. Now they can't do that because the speed service is being withdrawn. And as a result, they have to catch at least two buses to get to the station. So what do they do? They drive instead. Um, and so actually we're seeing it harder to move around by public transport, and it's putting a higher emphasis on the use of the car. And 
um, I support this motion because it's trying to reverse that and actually have, a, have us using public transport for our daily journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kandaka, do you accept this as a friendly amendment? Yes, Chair, it's very friendly. I'm very happy with Living Streets and it doesn't contradict anything we want to do. All right, and I'd just like to point, I've been told to point out to Jerry that uh, you need, if you want to speak again, uh, you need to speak. Yeah, okay. speak in the debate if I need to. Uh, yeah, you need to speak to the debate, but you wouldn't have a right to reply. Yeah, that's right, are, are, there any other amend, are there any other amendments? Well, in that case, we'll open the debate and we start off with Councillor Dave Parsons. Dave. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to say that I absolutely support this motion, we'll be voting for it um, and, uh, and agree with everything that's been said. Um, Keith mentioned integration a lot and, and that's obviously a key to it. Uh, and I appreciate that this is a transport policy, but I think in terms of air quality, we do need to go a lot further. And like a lot of things, it starts in the home. Uh, I was reading some very interesting stuff on uh, particulate uh, uh, problems in, uh, in air quality. And there's a recent uh, study being conducted in London, which found, for example, that 38% um, that of the particulates in the atmosphere came from uh, log burners and solid fuel burners, essentially. Um, that only 16% came from vehicles. Now, obviously, all of this needs removing we need to get to our uh, our actual um air, air quality i don't want to just pick on log burners it happens i don't have one but i have gas central heating and i know that uh, with you know gas central heating certainly develops uh, sulfur dioxide and there are problems there um in a sense what we do need to do is to talk about the things uh, it's fairly easy to talk about transport because people tend to agree with it and um and go along with this but not necessarily look at what we've got to change in our own homes i absolutely agree with the uh, approach that's been taken it's no good thrusting uh, um deadlines down people's throat when they can't be met um, but I do feel that we need to um, widen the debate and to actually look at the the whole picture of air quality which goes way beyond just transport I shall be supporting this motion I absolutely uh, agree with everything that's been said but um, I'd like to see a bit more integration and looking at the wider aspects of this thank you chair Thank you, Dave. The next, speak, the next speaker I've got is uh, Councillor Helen Adkins. Helen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, we, we fully support this motion and we also support the, um, the friendly amendment. Uh, I think, you know, it captures the moment. It's ambitious. It's thorough. Most significantly, it's in line with government policy. Um, you know, we declared a climate emergency last summer, which I can't believe it's been a year since then, but it has. And these are the sort of motions that we need, need to be supporting if we're going to um, meet the criteria of that climate emergency. It's also in line with some of the work that we're doing on the, the climate standing groups in, in relation to air quality, some of the things that people have called for, and also in relation to some of the workflow meetings that are happening at the moment um, re based around climate. So I really don't see any reason why anybody would not support this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Helen. The next speaker is Councillor Izzy Seckham. Izzy. Yeah, um, okay. Sorry, I'm, my battery is running low, so I'm hoping I'm okay. Anyway, the we still can't hear you. Put your microphone now. I am on mute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, the Conservative group will not be supporting it, and it is not that we are against the intentions of the um, of the notice of motion. It is about the process that it's gone through. Uh, we need to 
at this time more than ever we need to put a costing against is more particularly we don't need to understand the impact against our recovering businesses of the intentions of this uh, this notice of motion i think the for me there is a process that has been bypassed which is about the working groups that we've had which are cabinet run working groups it would then build into that and go towards the cabinet decision in september that would then get adopted into a process that would look at costings and putting some time scales against this of course what we have valued out of the covid crisis is the ability to have um free roads and clean air and to be able to uh, not have our um you know our peace um interrupted by airplanes and the likes but actually this is a moment in time that is going to change and we have to think about the future of our businesses because those businesses provide jobs for people as well so and in the notice of motion it talks about the preferred option being transport public transport uh in areas like mine there is no option for public transport we do not have the benefit of a system that is going to work to uh, to to suit the time frames of children going to school people trying to get to work in different areas and different places and the reality is you cannot have a one size fits all in warwickshire and what we need to do is look at the, the impact of the proposals that keith you put forward not that we are against the principles of trying to reduce emissions but we have to balance it with recovering businesses jobs and the ability for our residents to fulfill the life that they want to leave lead and for those reasons we would ask that this go through and be discussed through the normal process of working groups and task and finish and get involved in the budget processing thank you Thank you, Izzy. The next speaker I have is Councillor Judy Falk. Judy. Thank you, Chairman. I will be supporting the motion and the amendment. I just wanted to make a comment on the amendment. Uh, well, I, I agree that the Living Streets are uh, an interesting body and should be worked with. I also want to shout out for our own small road safety team that go into schools. Um, I wasn't aware of the team until recently. Um, but I'm now, they do some great work with, uh, with schools in, in Warwickshire. They are a small team, but I would want um, them to work alongside organisations like the Living Streets or even more money being put into their team as well as the Living Streets. We, we've got an excellent team there who um, could be expanded. Um, so, yes, I will support it, both the motion and the amendment, but I would like... Um, our own road safety team who go to schools to be commended for what they already do. Thank you, Judy. Uh, the next speaker I have is Councillor Bill Gifford. Bill. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking in favour of both the motion and the, uh, and the Liberal Democrat amendment. I'm perplexed by... Uh, Councillor Lee Seckham's uh, comment that the Conservative group won't be supporting this motion. It's not actually damaging the various routes you might use. It says the Council is committed to considering the following principles when revisiting the local transport plan. And the principles the leader of the council says she agrees with but feels it's not going through the right process the process isn't determined exactly here but the principles are set out i i'm concerned that we can't accept these principles um when looking at revisiting the local transport plan um I mean, I, the local transport plan is clearly out of date, given the whole um, the, the fact that last year we we did 
declared there was a climate emergency. We didn't say there's a climate emergency, but we're not going to do anything about it. The climate emergency, but we're going to wait and see what happens. We said there was a climate emergency, and I believe there is a climate emergency. I believe that the current pandemic is in part due to that climate emergency. And it's in, it has taught us various things. It's taught us the value of clean air. It's taught us the value of not travelling so much and not making unnecessary journeys. <coughs> I can see no... I, I'm amazed that the Conservative group wish to, to vote against this. Um, I'm, I don't think the public will understand that. I, I'm just surprised um, and perplexed. I would urge those members of the group, of the Conservative group, who have really thought seriously about their vote for the climate emergency, and indeed the common sense, to support this <coughs> motion. It's not, an, it's not a motion that even goes against government policy, as far as I can see, at least not the government policy as it's been spoken about by the by grant chaps. Mm. I can see no reason not to support it. I can see a number, vast number of reasons to support it. So I'm disappointed with the Conservative group. Mm. Well, I did expect better of. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, uh, I would just like to point out that the local transport plan is a 10-year plan that was actually uh, approved by council in 2016. So it's obviously out of date. I mean, certainly with the climate change emergency last year, uh, things have moved on hugely. And that's the reason why this council is employing consultants who at this very minute are looking at the uh, how to change the LTP and they will, they will be reporting back this autumn and the cabinet and council will be looking at uh, and, and talking about how we can agree with those amendments. So it's a work in progress. And so that's the reason why I suspect we're, we're, we're holding fire on it. The next speaker I have is Councillor Claire Goldby. Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you hear me OK this time? OK, um, you, you've kind of just preempted what I was going to say in so much as that we are uh, currently looking at redoing the uh, the LTP and it's I would want to wait until we get the results back from there um, not to presuppose anything and again I would support what Councillor Second said about taking things through the right processes um, I would also like to add to that that those processes would also help protect people who are not necessarily going to be able to afford major changes in how they they go about their daily transportation needs. Not everybody is fortunate enough to be able to afford an electric vehicle. So we have to take all these considerations into, into account. Um, it's strange really as well that the proposer of this motion has actually just voted down the rail strategy, which would actually open up access on public transport by building stations where there are currently no stations at all. So uh, again, I, I find that at odds with itself. But I would happily go through this if it went through the right processes and we knew the uh, overarching effects that would come out of it from a cor the correct processes being undertaken. But I, I have issues with this coming through the council as a motion with nothing to back it up. So to, to point out uh, a comment, our goods will be delivered through an integrated and efficient sustainable delivery system. That sounds brilliant, but how is it going to work in practice? How much is that going to cost? How will it be policed? And that's the sort of thing that I would like to to get a bit more detail on before I could commit to anything, which is why I think we shouldn't presuppose the outcome of the, the, the current LTP review. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I can see no more speakers uh, on my on here on the, on my screen, so I'd like to ask and, and catch the Chilvers has spoken already. So I'd like to go back to Keith Kandaka to uh, move the motion. Thank you very much, Chair. In terms of air pollution, traffic is about a quarter of air pollution. But one of the key things is it's very, very localised. 
So it's actually localised to those 10 or 15 yards either side of the road. So in those areas, people living on busy roads, it is actually 90% of the pollution they get is from the traffic. So it, it, it's important to understand from what David Parsons says, it's the difference between national emissions and actually what the emissions are if you were to live on a certain street. On the wider point, I'm really disappointed that Councillor Seckham doesn't understand what the local transport plan is. The local transport plan is very much a visionary document, a what we'd like to do. And the role of the county council is to give some direction um, to these processes. So this is not a budget process. This is not putting in projects into our annual budget or even our long-term plan. This is so it sits on the shelf of the transport planners and hopefully they take off when they want to develop a new piece of transport infrastructure. And it is very carefully worded to follow government policy. So we're not asking the council to do anything um, that is not government policy. What we're asking is for these principles to be considered. Not yeah, it, it has been very much constructed as a guidance, not a prescription. Um, to the process and these are principles that I don't think anyone's actually spoke against um, and if someone lives in Lower Tyso or somewhere there is perfect opportunity for them to drive this is not banning cars this is making a world in which they become less necessary in the urban areas and in the rural areas it may very well be that people drive in and transition onto a rail system or electric buses, etc. This is about making a better system. And we're talking here in very general top level terms. This motion has been through the officers. It has no budgetary pressure on the council. This is a top level. Please consider these five items, now six items, for the amendment to move forwards. So I, I really do not understand why there is so much of a backlash against this, because uh, it is very, very non-controversial. We are following Grant Shapps forward in the latest uh, utterances from government, and it has very wide cross-party support everywhere. Um, I would like to take a, an, another mention about, because Councillor Golby criticised me for not supporting the Neaton Parkway. The Neaton Parkway doesn't follow these principles. I'm really passionate about building stations and rugby right, integrated into rugby new housing. Yeah, if that follows these principles, then it is an integrated transport policy. Building a railway station in Leicestershire to serve Warwickshire when there's no connections is not. So this is all about integration. Councillor Stevens, in an earlier debate about the rail policy, talked about um, the need to integrate things. This should join up with the rail policy. So I do hope um, members will have a look at it. Uh, I do hope Councillor Second will actually have a word with officers and have a explain differences of the policy, because this is just a policy document that is used for designing new stuff. It is not a rule against people driving. And it's a great disappointment that uh, Councillor Clark isn't here because obviously as a cabinet member for planning and transport, he may have been able to put a more uh, nuanced uh, explanation in as to the council controlling group's position. But I say it is very strange you're not supporting this very much needed steer on our local transport plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Keith. I mean, so I think we're now going to vote on the Liberal Democrat amendment to the Green Motion 1. So, uh, Chair, we'll... the amendment was accepted. Yeah, that's right. So, yes, that's right. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the vote. So we are voting on the amended um, motion as accepted as friendly. Are there any votes against? I'll just wait till they stop coming in before I count them. These are votes against the amended motion.
Sorry, folks, we're having to move up and down the screen here. I make that 26 votes against, therefore the amended motion is lost. So, sorry, Chair, can you tell us how many councillors are present so we know? There are 51 councillors present. Can I have it as a recorded vote then, as it's that close? Because. Uh... It's too late, I'm advised, to call for a recorded vote. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the motion is lost. We now go to the green motion number two, which is about short-term capacity building for community groups. And I'd now like to ask Councillor Jonathan Childers to move the motion. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. And just to clarify, this is a green and independent group motion, not just uh, a green motion. Um, um, Councillor Gisan will be seconding um, in a moment. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting to the right place. Um, so, yes, so this motion is about short term capacity for, for community groups. And I think we're all aware about how uh, the amazing way that uh, local community groups have responded during the COVID crisis. And actually, the list of community led support groups uh, that the, our locality team could get pulled together now runs to 67 pages which i just think is is a fantastic tribute to, to everything uh, our communities and town parish councils in warwickshire have been doing and i think councillor coburn um, eloquently uh, at the start of this morning described that amazing response um during the pandemic um with some very eloquent words there. And I think we all know that we'll have found ways to thank those people in our communities that have been so active and, and also, um, you know, um, encourage people to help. And I also know that all of us would like to see those groups continue and develop in the future. And that this is something that's been looked at in the slightly longer term in the community uh, and voluntary sector recovery group, COVID recovery group work group. So, um, I'm aware that that's going on. But the reason that we're bringing this motion to full council is because of the urgency of the proposed piece of work. Um, many of the new groups that set up over the last few months in our communities, and I'm sure you'll all be aware of uh, them near you by WhatsApp or online, are right now considering what they should be doing next, whether to carry on um, or whether these things will just fade away. Um, and so um, this motion says we need to act now to capture those key people, capture, to, to be in contact with those key people in a really proactive way um, before kind of people end up going back to work or other things in their life. And we might end up losing contact with those groups that, that people were part of. And I just think there's a real opportunity here to address issues that we as a council really care about, like loneliness in, the, in our long term communities. Um, a million older people are on their own on Christmas Day every year. Uh, and we want to do something about that. And this is a real opportunity to do that. But if we urgently, we could lose that opportunity. And that's my concern about the Conservative amendment um, to this motion, is that it lacks the urgency. We need to uh, pay or um, uh, put a project in place to proactively reach out to all these groups over the next two months, month or two before they fade away into the background. And Councillor Seckham and others have talked today about being agile as a council and about acting quickly. Um, and we need to act now at this side of the summer, not in September, October or November, um, to reach out to groups and offer them support on things like funding, strategy, whether they want to constitute, if that's the direction of one, or to broker voluntary placements for individuals. Um, October or November could well be too late. And that's why we put the, the motion forward in the way we have. Still receive the scrutiny and evaluation it needs as a project through the Sustaining Prevention Fund application process. But we want to see that application put in urgently. Um, and we've seen this process so often in 
So, um, you know, through the urgent decisions, we've shown we can be an agile council and this is another time that we need to do that. The localities team have done a fantastic job in recent months, but they don't have the capacity currently to do this urgent, proactive piece of work that's needed. And that's why we're calling that additional resource. We're not talking loads of money, relatively speaking, compared to other sums, um, probably £30,000 or like a, another, uh, another part of the organisation. So again, we've shown as an organisation that we can find the funding and the time to build a good project at short notice. Um, and that's why um, we're putting this proposal forward. So I recommend it to you um, to give the right support to the groups in each of our areas. Um, um, the, new, the new group sprung up over the, the pandemic uh, across the summer and early autumn. I can put this motion to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I believe that we've got Councillor Dan Gisain who's going to second you. Uh, Dan, do you want to reserve your right to speak? Yes, please. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, If I can second that, I'm reserving the right to speak, that'd be great, thanks. That's OK, that's fine. Uh, do we have any amendments? I believe we do have an amendment from Councillor Heather Tim. So, Councillor Tim. Yes, I have tabled an amendment to this notice of motion. Uh, and um, to be fair to uh, Jonathan, we've also uh, discussed some of the areas that he's been talking about. Um, the, um, we do want to thank the huge number of people and community groups that have come forward during this pandemic. And that includes our town and parish councils, who, after all, are volunteers as well. So uh, we, we need to make sure that we thank them fully and, and appreciate everything that they've done during this time. I think there is a real opportunity to engage with individuals and volunteer groups that could have addressed some of the long-term issues, not just loneliness, but some of the other things. And that fits very well with our social uh, prescribing agenda. Where I differ is the process, I think, again. I, I would like to acknowledge and support the work undertaken by the cross-party COVID-19 recovery groups. Um, in considering what can be done to enable new community groups to keep everybody in, engaged in their communities. Certainly from my perspective, I know the work of the uh, working group for communities has already completed its work um, and the other two will complete in the next two weeks. Um, they have identified areas that where we can uh, support groups and they've all been identified through this process. So we're already working at speed and we already have that uh, work all, all set out and ready to go. And we've also um, committed, it, doesn't it, it will go through Cabinet, but there will be actions that we can take uh, and keep taking through the recovery phase that are not associated with a decision to the Cabinet. Um, we have also, during this process, we brought forward the councillor grants in order to fund some of these groups. So we've, we've, there's much work that has already been done and uh, certainly think that in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for the uh, recovery groups to complete their work on cost-cutting themes, um, we will um, continue the work that our localities team do, which is exactly the, the points that uh, Jonathan, uh, Councillor Childers Chil uh, raised uh, about constitution, about uh, what are the things that they need. So. I have made these amendments in the spirit of we are doing the work, we're getting on with it, and we will be getting on with it at speed and with urgency. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. First of all, I think we have a seconder. Councillor Second, do you, you want to second this? And do you want to reserve your right to speak? Um, yes, I'd like to reserve my right to speak. Okay. So, Councillor Chilvers, would you accept this amendment as a friendly one? Um, no, we're not going to accept this as a friendly amendment on the, while we recognise a lot of the work being doing, um, it, it, we're just not convinced there's sufficient urgency um, on this particular matter. Okay, well we'll open it up for debate. I've got four there was a Liberal Democrat amendment as well? Uh, I wasn't aware of that, sorry, I apologise. Uh, uh, Sarah? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's due to be moved by Councillor Rickards. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, Councillor Rickards then, please... Um, Please speak now. 
Thank you, Chair. Just put my camera on. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to put my camera on. Can you still hear me? Sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, there you are. Uh, we can hear you, Clive. Okay, can see you. Um, yeah, the amendment is to, under the second bullet point, to insert um, after loneliness in the final line, mental health and anxieties. So that final um, line would be long term issues such as loneliness, mental health and anxiety in our community. Thank you very much. Uh, and and, and, and I'd, I'd like to speak to that if there's a seconder. Yeah. Who, uh, do we have a seconder? Yes, I'm, I'm seconding it. And do you reserve your right to speak? No, I, I think it's uh, Councillor Rickard's going to speak now. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to speak I'll, to that. And then I'll speak after Councillor Rickard's, if I may. OK, right. Yeah. Well, okay. Before, you, before you start, can I just ask if uh, Councillor Childers would accept this as a friendly amendment? I think I'm waiting to hear what, um, like to hear what um, the speakers have to say. OK, Councillor Rickards. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> It, the, the present COVID crisis uh, has writ large the problem of social isolation. And I, and I was glad to hear the mention of social prescribing in relation to that, something I think we've forgotten a little bit about. Um, in, in the wake of that social isolation, um, there, there has been a magnification, as I think most people expected, of all sorts of mental health problems. And so... Um, Quite simply, I think that any engagement with uh, local groups that have emerged during the pandemic that's, uh, you know, we're advocating here um, should uh, include an attention, a specific attention to problems of mental health, not only clinically defined, but as I'm trying to suggest by the word anxiety here, um, you know, just just general mental problems that might not necessarily be clinically defined so um you know it's, it's quite simply to add something in that i think we need to make a specific reference to thank you very much uh councillor bode yes thank you thank you uh, chair yes I, I would support um everything that my colleague has just said uh, i think um a lot of us are extremely concerned about the mental health of many of our residents um whether they're young and anxious about school, whether they're older and anxious about isolation, um, whether they're just anxious about life in general. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount of anxiety and, and worry from from um, from our residents. If anybody saw there was a very interesting piece on the news last night about people living with learning difficulties, struggling to understand um, what on earth is happening with, with the pandemic and finding life extremely difficult. So we just thought adding in those words about um, mental health just just strengthened what is what i think is a really really good motion um can i just um say that i've been on, involved in the community's covid working group and i've actually mentioned this whole issue of mental health um isolation um and lots of factors affecting this but i, I think we, it is i would agree with the thrust of the motion from um councillor chill i think we need to be taking action as soon as possible and i have made that point in the in the working group i think it's really really important we can't wait on some of these issues because it, it really will be too late. So I do hope that the uh, the movers of the motion can accept this as, as how it's meant, which is, is a very, very friendly amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bird. Uh, Councillor Childers. Um, yes, very happy thoughts? to accept this as a, a friendly motion, uh, amendment. I think it adds to the motion. So thank you. OK, right. We'll open it up for debate then. Uh, I've got three speakers at the moment for uh, we'll start off with Councillor Helen Adkins. Helen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, we, we fully support the motion and we, we support the friendly amendment, but we do not support the Conservative amendment, which lacks urgency. I, I'm, I'm a bit kind of frustrated, really, that we seem to be going backwards in the way we approach things now. I mean, if anything, COVID has taught us that we can move quickly and we can do things <laughs> at, at speed when we need to. And that although processes are important, it's the end goal that we have to we have to aim for, and we we need to capture the, the great work that's gone on in Warwickshire from various community groups. And if we don't do that, then that work will be lost, and we won't be able to take it forward. If there is, um, you know, 
and another surge in cases and, and we know that this this pandemic is not over so i'm really frustrated that the conservatives seem to want to move backwards and, and slowly on certain things um you know we do we do need to move with urgency thank you thank you helen um the next speaker i've got is councillor andy crump andy right thank you um Obviously, I, I was chairing the community's uh, recovery group and much of the things in this motion and much of the things, many of the things spoken about already have been covered um, during the process. And uh, Councillor Bode was on uh, the group and made uh, many valuable contributions, one of which was talking about isolation, um, be it rural mm -hmm. or urban, and how important uh, good transport links were as well as part of that isolation. Again, we spoke about mental health uh, in, in great deals and the impact of it on all parts of our community and how different measures can be put in place. Uh, I fully support the fact that we have moved extremely quickly with our shielding hub uh, operation it's, it's exemplary and we contacted many, many groups. Trading standards, in fact, have got a list of 300 voluntary groups that uh, they were contacted on a regular basis, new groups as well in particular, where they've got details. And they gave those groups a named contact at the council for them to get in touch with on, on any problems. So we have built up this database. We are engaging with those communities, uh, those special groups that have, have come to the fore and stood up for their communities. And I, I think uh, Councillor Coburn mentioned the Farm Army for for. for prescriptions um, so again um, it's a shame that councillor uh, Chilvers uh, or one of his group uh, didn't attend that community group because a lot of these things were already being uh, being covered uh, a great work on, on ch uh, children's um, education and also about needs as well that's uh, is carrying on some great work as well and we'll continue um, it's another area we, we were working on so, um, yeah, a, a big shout out to Grishal and Charles for their teams in the localities of a lot of work that they've been doing with the communities. Obviously, the people in the communities are the local heroes. They know what's going on and, and can then help us identify the need and target to resources of people in the most need. So I'm certainly impressed the way that Mr Powell uh, responded at that meeting yesterday, how we were responding quickly, efficiently to ever-changing needs and you know, I, I fully totally disrefute uh, refute the fact that the council isn't working uh, very fast. We seem to be going back, which is uh, far far not my experience so um, I, I certainly think we did a good job on that working group. We're the first ones to finish and uh, even Councillor Bode, and I will quote this so it's in there recorded, it was recorded yesterday as well, that I chaired the meeting with good humour and patience. So, and that is uh, coming from a, a politician of not the same uh, political persuasion as me. So um, that's all I'd like to say on the matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. The next uh, speaker is uh, Councillor Dave Parsons. Dave. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to uh, agree with Councillor Atkins. Uh, I'm somewhat uh, perplexed. It would seem to me that uh, two very well intentioned motions uh, have been, in a sense, uh, stopped by bureaucratic fiddling, and, and that uh, that is a shame, I think, uh, and uh, or certainly one stopped and one threatened to be stopped. Um, I really think we can do better than this, and I, I think this is sad. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next is Councillor Claire Goldby. Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to say quite a lot of what's already been uh, been said about the the working groups we did move quickly across the board on working groups and the outcomes will be um will be quicker than actually um putting in any bids to to any external funding um now 
I, I disagree that we are moving backwards as well. And I'd also like to point out that Warwickshire Carver, um, and I've got an I've got a, a, a current working example of this in my area. It's something that I'm involved with. Um, Warwickshire Carver are actually there helping people to um, form groups officially and to constitute and to seek funding. Um, and this, this, like I say, I've got a, a working example of this in my area. And um, th they were quick on the draw as soon as I asked for assistance, they were there. So there are already avenues to be doing the sort of thing that is being asked for here. And it's incumbent on us as councillors to be able to signpost people to the relevant um, the, the relevant groups that can, can assist rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. So I'd like to put out also uh, thanks for people who have been involved in communities that did get involved. Some of them are now going back to work, which is a shame. Um, and um, the, the options are out there. If you want to form a constituted uh, community action group, you can do that now. We don't we don't need this motion um, in its entirety to, to do that. So thanks to Carver for everything that they're doing in my area. And thanks to everybody that's helped out uh, across the board with with COVID. Thank you, Claire. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Keith Kandaka. Keith. Thank you. Very, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I've got my hands raised and lowered. Um, it is a massive opportunity for people to make a new start um, over the next six months, unfortunately brought back by dreadful circumstances. The furlough scheme is about to taper off. Um, various things are going to change and people will have found new things they're interested in and take on new activities during this time. So that the third sector is going to get damaged by this but also an opportunity for new starts and so I, I think a lot of what's in this motion is about capturing that and getting it funded well carver does an awful lot of good stuff um but it, a, a motion actually firmly putting this third sector stuff into a higher gear would be marvelous i really do see um it, one of these periods of the darkest hour is when things um new things start and as far as covid is concerned we've had a marvelous reduction in death rates and in cases over the last two or three weeks we've come through cases that have started very high in april gradually declining and declining and declining we have no idea if they're going to be a, a new wave or not coming forward but now is the time to actually be boosting these third sector groups giving people a new start um and getting our third sector support going. Um, and it doesn't seem that controversial a motion. Um, for people like Claire to say we're already doing this, well, doing it a bit more seems a good plan. Um, and given the closeness of the last vote, I would like, Chair, to move this next vote as a recorded vote. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Before I move on to the next speaker, can I ask everybody to turn their cameras off if they're not uh, saying anything? Uh, thank you. Uh, the next speaker I've got is uh, Dave Shilton. Dave. Right. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't know if the photograph's up there. The camera's on, uh, whatever, but I've, I can't see me anywhere. Um, so what's happening, I don't know. Um, I can hear you, Dave. I, I might be looking yeah, at the ceiling, but seen, carry on. About. Um, and I've got a tie on as well. The, uh, <laughs> the thing with this is, that I don't know how many people have been talking to their community champions. Unfortunately, Dunedin haven't provided a community champion. Perhaps that's where they're being left out over there. And I suggest that they should rethink it and put a community champion forward. Only the four, the other four that we've got, the different uh, districts and colours, we had a meeting the other day, and I'm champion of it, for the Warwickshire, <laughs> actually spoke so highly, so highly, of the fact that their communities are coming back together like they've never seen before. So the communities are coming back together through this COVID, and that's good news. That's good news. It is important to keep them together, but that's what we're saying through that route, the, uh, the, the, the actual champions route, one from each of the, the districts and boroughs. Uh, talking about thanking people, we're also doing that. So, uh, uh, Charles and Laurie, uh, we actually instructed those two uh, on suggestion 
to send out letters of thank you to the parish councils and those that they know um, have been uh, committed to helping people and uh, securing those people which are lonely. That's what this group's all about, bringing people together. And don't forget, Lord Lieutenant, yeah, has also sent a letter out to every person that has been so we're all on board with that. It is important that we keep it on board. It's important that we take it forward. But I think the way that the, the motion is made is not the way forward with it. I believe Claire's completely correct. Ask for help, you get it. And uh, let's go forward with that. But it, it's important that we do thank them and uh, keep them on board as much as we can. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I have no more speakers I can see, so we're going to go back to the first of all to the seconders who have reversed their right to speak in reverse order. So first of all, Councillor Izzy, second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I'm going to start with the seconders. Again, this is about process again. I don't like talking about process, but the reality is we have had working groups, cabinet working groups, which are doing the work that has been put forward in this notice. We can't hear you again, Izzy. Yeah. I've done it again. I put my thing on the head, my microphone on the head. Thank you. So just once again, this is the uh, work of the working group that has been chaired by Andy Crump and, and I believe actually others as well. Heather Timms has been chairing one which talks about this. All the working groups have the ability to process exactly what is going on through this notice of motion. What we're doing here is putting two hairs running, which I think is extremely unhelpful. What we need to do is channel the work of that working group or those working groups through to a decision that will go forward. So I'm really keen that what we don't do is have a number of different work streams going off in different directions or even duplicating the work that they're doing because that is a, an unhelpful resource of, of our, our officer time at what is a very challenging time. I think what I'd would just say is I'd ask the um, movers of the notice of motion to consider that and perhaps even now at this late date uh, see if we couldn't just strengthen the work of the cabinet working groups and get this through. There is no work that is going on through our voluntary groups, our parish councils and our communi community champions that will not continue to happen we will be backing them. I've already explained earlier on in this meeting the amount of support that the council has put in, and it is not about to stop where need is. But what we do need to do is evaluate that work and make sure that it isn't uh, leaving gaps or that it isn't duplicating what is already going on. It needs balance. And I would suggest that there is a better way of doing it. And I'd ask the movers to consider taking their amendment and putting it through the working groups as as ours does. Thank you. Alan's on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Uh, right, we're now going to ask the seconder of the motion to talk. Uh, that was Dan, Councillor to get Dan Gassane. So Dan, the floor's yours. Oh, I'm here somewhere. Can you see me? Yes, we can. We can see yeah, and hear perfect. you, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate all the, all the work everyone's, everyone's put into this and, and the work that's going on at the minute. And I think the only kind of the reason we put this forward is because obviously people are going back to work. Carver have done brilliant work. People at the county have done brilliant work, especially helping these organisations. And we're speaking to the community teams as well who've, who've done all sorts. And I think the, the, this, the motion we put forward is kind of to draw and back this up. So instead of going through the scrutiny process and taking, you know, several months, we, we get it done now. It will still go through a process the way we've worded the motion. So it still will be scrutinised. We're not just going to chuck money randomly, but it's a small amount of money in, compared to what we'll actually do with that and the impact it will have. But as people start going back to work and, you know, leading their normal lives as they were before, we've got someone, whether it's a 
the person we move into this role or we employ someone, we've got someone to actually take over and just organise the the support that's already there, the volunteers. So the Kenilworth group, um, Kenilworth COVID-19 group, is over 300 strong uh, volunteers. Um, and that's just one area. Um, we're talking about various groups in Morrissey with hundreds of members. Um, and a couple of these are run by like one person or two people. And a lot of their supporters aren't, you know, they're not very, they don't want to be involved with organising people or using the technology. Whereas you have one central person, first of all, they can take that work they can obviously we'll get the right person in the first place who can help organize that better so to use their time better but we can also track what they've done and who they're helping and put them in the right direction then into to other areas rather than just leave these groups to to deal with carver um so yeah i i, I appreciate the the kind of the, the reasons it's being moved but it kind of takes away the, the point of the motion in the first place um because all we're doing then is just just recognizing the work thanking them but not really doing anything with that so i don't accept any of the um, amendments and i want to go forward with our motion because we can make a real difference if we do it now thank you dan um, thanks jeff we now uh, go on to the mover of the amendment councillor heather timms heather Okay, can you see me now? Um, we can. Okay, lovely. Uh, in Warwickshire, we've always had a very strong uh, voluntary sector and we will be continuing to have a very strong uh, voluntary sector. They have done amazing work throughout this pandemic and we really do want to say thank you to them and, and all of our staff who've worked with them, um, Kashal's team and Charles Barlow. And in those people, we have that central person already. It exists. It's there. It's not just Warwickshire Carver who we fund to do this work. It is also the whole team that we have here at Warwickshire County Council. We've also identified the areas where the, the support is needed through the working groups. And that work will carry on. And it will not be held back by, um, you know, not having a bid into the uh, investment fund, which will take time from officers to write and also will distract them away from offering the support that they need to to the groups that are out there now and thinking about their role in future. So I would say we need to um, move this amendment forward and move our voluntary sector forward with a very, very big thank you for what they've done so far. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. I'd now like to go to the move of the motion, uh, Councillor Childers, to sum up. Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you uh, for all the contributions. Um, and um, yeah, and thank you to um, Councillor Crump for his work on that uh, community, chairing that um, community uh, COVID recovery group. And um, Echoing everyone that, that has thanked the, the voluntary uh, sector and, and, and our localities team who have done an amazing job. Um, I'm slightly, uh, I guess, um, confused that apart from the process issue, um, if whether um, the proposers of the amendments um, do support putting extra temporary capacity into um into our local localities team to cope with all this extra work that's coming forward um whether they support that because if they do then i'm certainly was was very open beforehand and is still very open to finding open suggestions of finding the way to do that in a way that they're happy with the process um to do it in a speedy way if they think they that capacity is needed if they don't think that capacity is needed, um, I think that's possibly what Councillor Golby was saying, that the, she thinks maybe the capacity is already there, then that's a slightly different situation where we disagree. Um, but I would I would say I'm still, whatever the outcome of this, uh, this process, is, this motion is, let's, if you think that we need to put some extra temporary capacity, to the localities team to deal with all the you know help support all these extra groups that have sprung up then let's find a way we're all happy with doing it um, with the process that you're happy with doing it in as fast as we can um, so um, yeah I'd ask you to accept the original motion um, with the Liberal Democrat amendment included 
so that we can um, find a way of urgently getting this extra capacity um, in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Right, we're going to go to the vote now. We've asked for a recorded vote. And uh, we'll start off with the amendment. Okay, so we'll just clarify the amendment first. So the motion put forward on the printed papers has been put forward by um, Councillor Chilvers. That has been uh, amended by means of a friendly, uh, by means of a, a additional words from the Liberal Democrats, which have been accepted as friendly. Uh, the Conservatives have made some uh, amendments to the third bullet. So we are now voting on the Conservative Amendment. So we are voting on the current Conservative Amendment, which includes the uh, words uh, of the Liberal Democrats, which have been added as friendly. So we'll put that on the screen so everybody is clear about what you are all voting on. And just to clarify as well, um, if a recorded vote is requested, it needs to be requested by three or more members, and it needs to be requested before we go to the voting. So now is the time uh, to, to uh, make that request. So do I have three members? Uh, yes, I've got uh, Councillor Bow, Councillor Kandaka, Councillor Holland, and that's Councillor Chilvers. So. We will go to the recorded vote on the amendment. Okay, so when I call out your name, I will need you to reply by for, against, or abstain. Councillor Adkins. Against. Councillor Barker. For. Councillor Bell. For. Councillor Birdie. Birdie. For. Councillor Bode? Against. Councillor Brain? For. Councillor Butlin? For. Councillor Caborn? For. Councillor Cargill? For. Councillor Chilvers? Against. Councillor Coburn? <coughs> Councillor Crump? For. Councillor Darmash? For. Councillor C. C. Davies. Against. Councillor N. Davies. Against. Councillor Dervix. Against. Councillor Falk. Against. Councillor Fragley. Hi, that's John here. Glad here. Councillor Fragley. I'm just voting. We'll be with you in about three seconds. I think Councillor Fragley and Councillor Rolf got called out to a a county meeting at Stratford set up by the directors, which is a bit naughty. Well, there then. Indeed. So, unfortunately, Rolf and Fragley, if they're not here to vote, can't be recorded. Councillor Gifford. Oh, so against, against, against. Take your time, everyone. Councillor Gilbert. Councillor Gisane. Against. Councillor Goldby. For. Councillor Gran. For. Councillor Hayfield. For. Councillor Holland. Against. Councillor Horner. Councillor John Horner. For. Councillor Jens. For. Councillor Cor. For. Councillor Condacor. Against. Councillor Morgan? For. Councillor O'Rourke? Against. Councillor Panda? For. Councillor Parsons? Against. Councillor Phillips? Against. Councillor Redford? For. Councillor Ricards? Against. Councillor Roberts? Councillor Howard Roberts? For pressing the wrong button there. For. Councillor Rolf. She's gone to the same meeting with French Lee, which Mark Thank Rodney you. called. Councillor Roodhouse. Against. 
Councillor Sargent. Against. Councillor Seckham. For. Councillor Shilton. For. Councillor Simpson Vince. For. Councillor Skinner. Against. Councillor Stevens. For. Councillor Timms. For. Councillor Warwick. For. Councillor Webb. Against. Councillor C. Williams. For. Councillor P. Williams. For. Councillor Wright. For. Any abstentions? No. So that is carried at 30 votes for and 19 votes against. So that now becomes a substantive motion, which we will now move to a vote. Okay. Any votes against? I see two. Th votes against Councillor Condacore, Roodhouse. Parsons, Skinner, Adkins, N. Davies, Palp, Dervix, Ricards, O'Rourke, Phillips, Holland, Webb, Bode, Gifford. Any other votes against? Any abstentions? Lower your hand if you've voted against, please. Abstentions, raise your hands now. Falp, Ricards, C. Davies, Gisane. Any, lower your hands, please. Votes for. If you voted, please lower your hands. Votes for. Councillor Falp, I think you've voted already. Yes, sorry, sorry uh, Monica, I did vote against and I couldn't yes. put my hand down quick enough. OK, to be clear, we are now voting for Crump, Cabourn, Butlin, Cargill, Cor, Bell, Golby, Gran, Williams, P. Williams, Seckham, Timms, Barker, Jens, Horner, Hayfield, Simpson Vince, Warwick, Coburn. Are there any other votes for? Um, I yes. yes. Sorry, I'm moving down. Singberdy, Wright, no. Darmash, Gilbert, Panda, Morgan, C. Williams, Brain. And right. Is that every I, I, and Bob Stevens? Is that everyone I, I, for? No, Redford. Redford. I, I Roberts. For, 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 Roberts. Yeah. Yes. Me. Uh, Is that Dave Shilton I voted for? Dave Shilton I voted for. Keep your hands up, please. Well, I'll raise my hand now again. I haven't got a hand there. 
Right. Who hasn't got a hand who wants to vote for? Please speak. Redford. So, Redford. Roberts. Roberts. And Roberts. Is, is my hand raised? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I pressed the button. Dave, <laughs> Dave Chilton, Howard Roberts, your hands are raised. Right, okay. good. I'll take it down now. Leave it there, please. Leave, leave it, it there. there right. Oh, dear. Monica, um, Councillor Sergeant, I voted for. Councillor Sergeant voted for. There are more for than against. We will confirm the numbers with councillors after the meeting. Thank you for your patience. Monica, sorry to butt in. Can yes. I just say, it's Helen here. Can I just say, uh, Councillor Davis has been trying to get back on the call, but cannot get back on. She keeps getting, getting I think she lost connection and then she tried to get back on again and again and again, hasn't been able to. Okay, um, I'm not sure what I can do about that because we have two other members who were absent also for the vote, so I think that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can all put your hands down now, please. Thank you, everyone. Chairs on mute. Councillors, could I please ask you to put your hands down for the moment and if somebody is sharing their screen, could they please unshare? Ah, oh, excellent. Thank you. Oh, there we are again. Thank you. Stay there. OK, thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's, uh, and thank you for your patience. We now come to members question time. Uh, we've got to up to 40 minutes for questions to the leader, cabinet, portfolio holders or chair, chairman of the scrutiny committees. Um, I've got seven questions which have been notified uh, prior to meeting. So we'll start off with those first. And the first one is Councillor Keith Kandaka. Keith. Thank you very much, Chair. I assume this is for Les Caborn. Um, over the next last nine years, the project to build a GP surgery in Wellington division has obtained a site from the Churchfield developers and over £900,000 in approved Section 106 contributions. The site has outlined plan permission for the surgery and is spade ready. There's a GP waiting to get into a new surgery if one was built. Uh, there is no GP surgery in my division and a rapidly expanding population due to the seven approved housing developments. It is expected that next month the North Yorkshire CCG will formally scrap this project and instead expect residents to wait for a large PFI-like funded health centre on County Council-owned site, which is unlikely to happen soon, if ever. We need the County Council, a commercial firm or community organisation to own the building to get round the new NHS privatisation rules. Can the County Council intervene so we can have a new GP surgery before winter 2021-22? Thank you, Chair. Uh, on you're on mute, Les. We still can't hear you, Les. Yeah. Good, mate. Right. Okay. That yeah, we've got you. Off you go. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, this is this side is a long history, which I'll go through. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, people are fully aware of where we're at on this site uh, and other sites in in that in that area. Um, so the North Warwickshire um, CCG is currently reviewing two options for the development of new primary care. Uh, site for the people of North and there's two options um, a standalone 10 room GP practice at Churchfields or a 10 room GP practice integrated with health and well being at, uh, at Top Farm. Now, the Churchfields site is only large enough to hold the GP practice where Top Farm um, would, could see a development with County and Borough Council provide a, a fully integrated health and leisure uh, facility, which is 
uh, we are moving to integrated pubs. Um, uh, so that fits where the direction of tra tra travel is. And we would also need to consider um, what services could be moved out of hospital and into uh, a proper community, um, potentially located with, with the GP practices. The finances for either option are not confirmed at this time due to the complexities of securing funding and would be part of the final business case. The decision on how to proceed will be taken by the CCG governing body following a recommendation from the Primary Care Committee in August. An options appraisal process was undertaken across three workshops during June. These workshops included independent participants such as Can Councillor Condecor, Health Watch Warwickshire and Warwickshire Community and Voluntary Action to ensure that all the needs of the local people were heard and, and con considered. The intention of the workshops uh, is to give participants all the information they need to get a more informed contribution and then express their preference through an anonymous vote. The final two votes were undertaken only by the independent members of the workshop, uh, of which Keith Conical was an independent member, and showed an overwhelming agreement regarding preference across a wide range of stakeholders. The CCG is therefore confident that the outcome reflected stakeholder opinion. Uh, the output from the workshops, including all stakeholder feedback, was presented in the paper to the CCG Primary Care Committee. The final report prepared by an independent organisation will be going to the committee for recommendation in August. Following this, and it is a complicated process, uh, the final decision will be made by the CCG governing body with all the evidence and recommendations available to them for, for, to help them make that decision. In terms of the risk that Top Farm Scheme does not deliver the GP practice when the local population is, Candle Contical previously suggested that the CCG consider an interim option in the event that build was delayed. And that was a temporary facility providing two clinical rooms with a potential for delivery at the end of 21-22 for two to five years life uh, was considered by the CCG and identified that St Nicholas Clinic could accommodate the GP practice when it was first needed if necessary. Until the population growth and final delivery of, of an alternative site uh, was ready. Now that is, that is a position. It is it is complicated, uh, but I do not believe that Warwickshire can interfere in that process. Thank we you, Les. In charge of the process. Yeah, thank you. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor uh, Condiga? Yes, I do, Chair. Um, the fundamental need in Weddington is for a five consulting room practice, not a ten consulting room practice. And going forward, more consultation will be done over the internet. Um, it is really important that we actually get something done now while the need is there. So can you please look again at actually helping us get the GP practice we promised rather than one in ten years time? It's twice as big as what we need. Well, we don't we don't know the the uh, the, the time time, time for bill, um, and I did say that, that a delivery at St Nicholas, which is two to five, um, could be delivered. That was considered. I'm not aware that is totally abandoned. But I will inquire. If, but uh, it is not up to us to interfere in the process, or or go out looking for private bidders. Okay, thank you. Uh, question number two is from Councillor Clive Rickards. Five. Thank you, Chair. Um, is this for the leader of the council? I'll just try and turn my camera on. Oh, good. Um, given that the proposed Warwickshire Property Company will be wholly owned by the council and will set certain targets, what assurances are there on the nature of democratic control and scrutiny of the company? I'm going to pass this to Peter Butler because it is his portfolio, actually. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Councillor Butler. Uh, thank you, Clive, and, and thank you for notice of the question before the meeting started. It all helps very well for getting an answer. Um, as members know, work is ongoing following a cabinet decision in May to consider the setting up of a property company to support the council's ambitions for Warwickshire and the work necessary to ensure a robust recovery from COVID-19. 
As the work is ongoing, no final decisions have yet been taken as to the precise organisation of that company, how it will set up or a detailed governance. All those elements are subject to an ongoing consideration and legal advice. The outcome of that advice, along with recommendations covering the issues raised by Council Ricards, will be subject to a further reports to Cabinet and Council in October. Once established, as with uh, any council company, details of its financial position will form part of the annual accounts and performance, would, uh, and performance will be considered as part of our usual reporting arrangements. Although the precise mechanisms have yet to be confirmed, the intention will be for the council as shareholder to ensure a robust business plan is in place which clearly sets out the objectives of the company and enables the monitoring of the performance. Scrutiny at officer level will be via the trading board, which is made up of senior officers, including two strategic directors, and could be further considered by relevant OSC, uh, uh, the relevant OSC where members consider it appropriate to do so. Um, I hope that's con the question answer you uh, received. Uh, Councillor Rickards, do you have a supplementary? Uh, no, Chair. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. The third question is again from Keith Condicar. Councillor Condicar, Keith. Uh, thank you, Chair. This question was supposed to be to Jeff Clark, who um, was photoed with a speed limit sign, but I think he's away, so it may be um, Councillor Butlin is doing it. Uh, it's about the 30, minute, sorry, 30 mile an hour sign. So just over two years ago, the 30 mile an hour sign, and we're uh, sorry, after just two years, the 30 mile an hour signs have just been finally reinstated at the juncture of Camborne Drive and Eastborough Way. Would, he, would I be correct in thinking that County Council had a legal requirement to reinstate 30 mile an hour road signs after road schemes? And how many speed signs have been reported to County Council in the last two years? And can I ask it, any of the other? road signs taken over a year to be reinstated. Councillor Butler. Um, to be perfectly honest, I haven't got uh, uh, an answer to this one because I didn't know I was going to have to answer it. But uh, uh, I could get you a written answer and I'll kind of make sure that it's emailed to you forthwith. OK, uh, Councillor Kandaki, do you have a supplementary? or? Uh, yeah, I am disappointed that an answer wasn't provided as I put in this question at the beginning of the week and Councillor Clark was photographed with this sign being reinstalled, so I thought officers would be able to give me the history on this. Um, so can you endeavour to find out and also copy other councillors because missing road signs are really, really important, particularly 30 mile an hour ones. I, I uh, share your concern and uh, I'll make sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's an answer being... Uh, we, we do uh, actually have now. an answer for you, for you, Councillor Kandaka, that Councillor um, Seckham is just going to read out. It has been handed to me. I, um, Keith, sorry about that. I think it's probably got lost in, um, in who had it. So the answer is um, we have checked our inquiry records and although we have received requests to replace damaged speed limit signs, we have no record other than the most recent request to replace speed limit signs as a result of them being removed or not being put in place following a scheme. Apologies for the delay in resolving this recent issue. We normally replace damaged speed limit signs within 28 days. You're muted, Chair. I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, we're, we're going to go on to the next question now, if you're happy with that. So the next word question is, uh, for, uh, number four is from Councillor Helen Atkin. So, Helen, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, what is the county presently and actively doing to prevent the inequalities across the county further impacting upon such residents during the rest of the COVID crisis and will the council undertake a report focusing on the inequalities across the county and the impact such inequalities have and will have continued to have on the COVID pandemic? Thank you. Uh, and who's your question to? Oh, well, I guess that will be to Councillor Les Cabourn, yeah. Yeah, Leslie Cabourn. Okay, Councillor Cabourn. 
Okay. Um, we we are we are working on this as we always have been. We um, you're aware that we brought uh, the BME community and uh, COVID uh, report to council. That is the start. Uh, working in that community, and as I said at the time, that that is not that is going to be um, a two year project. And of course, the learning in that community will be rolled out to all other communities. But we are well aware of of the inequalities. Uh, and uh, public health and working as at all, all times. Uh, you have a supplementary yeah, question? Yes, I mean, I, I appreciate what you've said, um, but I think we do need to separate the two issues a little bit. I know they connect together, the BAME issue and social inequalities and health inequalities, but there are members of other communities that are also subject to those inequalities. And I think we need to, to be responding in in the same way to, to those issues as we are to the BAME community issues. Yes, and, th and they have been discussed in, in uh, the health, health, health working group and come forward with, uh, with everything else. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Councillor Caroline Davis, who's got the question. Caroline. I think it's... Uh... Corin Davis. Corin Davis. Sorry, keep getting um, <laughs> so That's what it's written down. The, Sorry. In the light of the Black Lives Movement, is the council monitoring its policies to ensure they prioritise diversity and inclusion within the county's workplaces? I'm not sure who would answer that one, but. Um... Councillor the Cord is going to answer that. Cam. Thank you, Chair. Um, many of you who know me from old will know that I've been a champion around equality and diversity and inclusion, not only within Warwickshire County Council, but in my previous life for, life for Rugby Borough Council. So having said that, um, how we have had clearly, we have clearly and publicly set out our commitment to equality and diversity and inclusion to our staff, partners and communities. There is no place in Warwickshire for inequality based on the colour of your skin. Our focus is on fostering diverse and safe communities where people treat each other with respect as an essential part of our community leadership and place shaping roles, working together with our partners to tackle this. In terms of our own staffing profile, people from black, Asian, minority, ethnic BAME groups make up 15.3% of our workforce compared to 11.8% of the Warwickshire population. And in the last year, we've seen a 1.3% increase in black and black British colleagues to 2.9% of our total workforce. But we are committed to doing more and believe that it is critical that we keep the conversation going, both within the organisation and within our, within our community. This is not just about what we say, but mostly about what we do. Prior to the COVID outbreak, officers were scoping a new equality, diversity and inclusion project as part of the council change programme to prioritise diversity and inclusion within the council workplace. This work is being finalised in light of learnings from COVID and Black Lives Matter and priorities identified, identified by member working groups on recovery. In the meantime, we've taken a number of actions, delivered strong internal external comms messaging and campaigns in support of Black Lives Matter, and enabled our staff to share their own personal and powerful stories, which have fed into articles and newsletters and staff briefings. Um, we've also undertaken community engagement work with under-representative groups in relation to fire and rescue recruitment to encourage more applicants from BAME communities. We've also launched a council-wide EDI staff group to ensure that we proactively seek and hear the views of staff from across the organisation and started a new proactive initiative across our senior leadership leaders around equality and diversity and inclusion, which will involve extensive staff engagement and provide real focus. This new equality, diversity, inclusion uh, project will be a central aspect of our refreshed people strategy, which will form part of our change programme. And where appropriate, we will inform proposed changes to council staffing policies for consideration by the Staff and Pensions Committee where appropriate. 
It is a theme which has emerged from cross-party working groups on recovery and we are absolutely committed to taking this forward as key priority to ensure that we continue to learn and create a more inclusive and cohesive Warwickshire. I'm happy to take a further question, Chair, if there is one. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Davis, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, uh, thank you, that's great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Corin. Right, the next question is from Councillor Dave Parsons. Dave. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a question for Les. Um, <coughs> excuse me. What is the Council doing to ensure that further outbreaks of COVID are prevented in care homes? Furthermore, what is the Council doing to ensure there is adequate PPE and protection for staff in care homes in the light of a possible second surge during the winter? Uh, thank, thank, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Table. Is everything on? Yes. Uh, thank, thank you for that, Dave. Um, this is something we've been uh, looking at all the time. COVID has been, and we are, uh, have been commended by the CQC um, for the way we've supported and, and cared for for the staff and residents in all in all our care homes. Uh, and we've also extended the same work to uh, private uh, care homes as well as the ones that we use as an authority. So um, the County Council, in partnership with Coventry City Council, the three CCGs, and community <laughs> health providers, have been supporting the care homes throughout the uh, pan pandemic, um, advising support, and obviously and are making continued progress. We, we have, through public health, uh, partnership preventing COVID-19, spreading care homes and community care settings, which is a partnership group, which is established at the beginning of the pan pandemic, not now, um, operationalising and coordinating all operational efforts mm -hmm. aimed to control the virus in these settings. And that group reports back to Coventry and Warwickshire System Care Group and into the Silver <laughs> Command Group as well. Uh, and the key activity that's performed is develop the Care Homes Outbreak Control Plan. It's uh, the Council and Health Partners have initiated and provided infection and prevention control in 154 care homes, with two more booked um, as we continue to work through all our care homes. And that's across Warwickshire, not just the ones. Um, in partnership with Public Health England, we've developed an IPC webinar for both care homes and the domiciliary care market, because both are equally um, important and with the system testing coordination group we implement and oversee the whole home testing program and the weekly care home test uh, program for for staff um, in addition we're uh, developing uh, infection controls to develop market care home resistance so that we embed policies procedure staff training so that all our homes um, effectively uh, manage themselves and are aware of everything they need to be aware of. And we've provided uh, providers with a home care COVID-19 resilience assurance process. And that's in a comprehensive evaluation of care homes. So I say they can help manage their day-to-day -day, uh, care in the home without waiting for an outbreak. And we do that jointly with a provider at the care home and a multidisciplinary team uh, across health and social care teams. Again, that's across Coventry and Warwickshire because any age of any cross border that you can appreciate. We're also still making mutual, mutual aid calls facilitated by our quality assurance and improvement officer and offering providers uh, opportunities to discuss COVID related related issues and also raise issues with guest speakers we bring into uh, that have a different breadth of knowledge to ourselves and can offer. Uh, additional advice and um, we do a daily review of the care home market status uh, through monitoring our dashboards uh, using the national capacity tracker and locally sourced information that we source ourselves to spread the mix of knowledge we have and then we make weekly calls to all commissioned and uncommissioned care homes to ensure we have continued dialogue and we offer any support they need and in addition of course we still have our PPE warehouse, uh, which is well stocked, and that already has uh, sufficient stock to cover any peaks in demand by second wave. So we are ready, uh, should we get one, uh, and we're like we're continuing as we do to monitor the demand on that warehouse all the time. So if we need to change uh, what's in there, 
uh, than, we, than we do. And uh, we, we do that uh, by giving any social care provider um, a source for PPE, which is a, a number we put out. And they can, if they find they've got a problem at all, they can get straight on to us and we will um, deliver in lines with best practice and, and current guidance. So we obviously constantly review the guidance that comes our way. I hope yeah, that helps. Thank you for that, Liz. Thank you. I mean, so, I mean, essentially, so Dave, you've got a set, have you got a supplementary question? Again, just a, a comment, if I may, Alan. Yeah, uh, I mean, essentially, what you're saying, Liz, is that we should there be a, a surge? You're confident we're in a better position. As we are. And we also have all yeah. our test and trace uh, facilities in the team um, that we're building up for that as well. So that will obviously work in partnership with any yeah. any home. Thank you very much for that, Liz. Thank you. Yeah. OK, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Dave. Uh, the seventh question was from Councillor Helen Atkins. Helen. Um, how is County preparing for the return of approximately 6,000 students, some international, many of whom will live in South Leamington. This refers to Warwick University students. Perhaps you could comment about how the county is working with the district. Yeah. Warwick district. Thank you. We've, we've been working with the university and the Brisbane district and the Landlords Association uh, for some time now. I did have a more detailed written reply, Helen, which I cannot find in my iPad at the moment. So I'll see that is fully circulated, if you bear with me. Um, but we are well aware uh, of, of the possible difficulties there and I'm sure some of the people living in the streets in that area are also concerned so we will be doing uh, posters and stuff for inside the premises uh, in conjunction with landlords to so the students are constantly aware of where, of where they need to be and where they need to support and of course we're in, in constant touch with the welfare department at, at, at the universities uh, but I will give you the uh, written answer as well to all, all members if that helps. That's great. But we are well aware of it thank you yeah. yeah are you happy with that that answer helen yes thank you okay well the eighth and last question that was presented prior to the meeting was from john holland so councillor holland yes uh, thank you chair uh, if i put this to the leader who may wish to pass it on to somebody else um it's about the warwickshire resident residents who are completing their full-time education this summer and they could be leaving they could be leaving school at 16 or uh, school six form or college at 18 or university at 21 and in other years they would have progressed into employment probably with more training but of course they've um, had their final part of their course disrupted not taken their exams and we've known for four months now that they are very unlikely to progress into, into employment. And in the 1980s, when we got to this position, the County Council took over organising a training, uh, sorry, workplace and programme. What is the County Council doing for this year's school leavers and college leavers? Thank you, John. I believe Councillor Hayfield has the answer. Colin. Councillor Hayfield has an answer, whether it's the one John Holland is hoping for. Um, we've got, uh, as a count, 5,979 children uh, finishing year 11. Now, this is a snapshot view at the moment, but at the moment, we think 3,087 of those are going off into educational training post-16. Further... 284 have applied for and are awaiting outcomes on those trainings. 29 year 11s have gone into apprenticeships. 13 year 11s have gone back into employment. Uh, by my reckoning, that still leaves over a thousand. In fact, that's 1,500 that we haven't got a clear picture of at the moment. We'll be monitoring those throughout August and hopefully uh, come uh, September, we'll have a much clearer idea on those figures and uh, our needs system will be going into operations to support those that haven't got a placement. Thank you, Colin. Do you have a supplementary question, Captain? Yes, yes, yeah. that, that means if, if there's about 10,000 uh, in the year group, um, then roughly speaking, there'll be 10,000 finishing um, education. Obviously, some will be finishing at 18, some at 21. And uh, the 
Public Recovery Workstream was talking about doing something for next year, but my question is about this year, because I would imagine of the 10,000 finishing full-time education, very few will be able to secure work. I'll be saying that in the next few weeks, we're going to work up a scheme suitable for possibly approaching 10,000 people. Uh, Chairman, if I can um, uh, respond to that. My figures for year 11 are not 10,000, they're just under 6,000. Um, and yes, you're right, not all of those have identified their future direction. But that's pretty much the case most years. It's accentuated this time, of course, and our processes will go into place to be able to sort of, through the neat process, which is uh, pretty good, uh, I wouldn't quite say world beating, but world class, but it, it's good. It's very good. Uh, and we're going to place to try and allocate places and keep an eye on these kids, make contact with them, find out what their plans are. And usually by September, October, we've approached 90 odd percent of them and know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Thank you for that, Colin. That's all the questions that were submitted prior to the meeting. We'll take questions from the floor and we start off with Councillor Caroline Phillips. Caroline. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did submit a question to uh, to Colin uh, earlier in the week. I think it was Monday, um, and it was about maintain nursery schools. And uh, I wanted to ask if you will support the national campaign. Uh, their their main aim is to, for lobbying the government to committing to review the early years funding formula as soon as possible, uh, but by 2021 at the latest. Thank you. Councillor Hayfield. Thank you. Um, just a little bit more detail than uh, I've been anticipating. Um, let us just say straight away um, that we are, and I think I speak across the chamber on this, immensely proud of our six maintained nursery schools and we will do everything in our power to support them. Uh, they are in a financially vulnerable position at the moment because the government has not been clear on whether, um, whether or what exceptions it is making to support maintaining nurseries as opposed to the general run of PVI nurseries. Uh, we know they're special. We know that the education they offer at a very important preschool age is desperately important. Um, and we will take part in any campaign that will lead to a, a, a secure future for them. Mm. Um, I think, uh, can I see if there's a second, a follow-up question to that? Tonight? Yeah, Councillor Caroline, have you got another question, a supplementary question? Uh, no, it was, it was just to get uh, support for the campaign, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. The next uh, person with a hand up is Councillor Kandaka. Councillor Kandaka. Just a quick question for Councillor Butlin, I assume. If the proposals for Coventry City Football Club to move to the University of Warwick become serious, um, can and will the Council be robust in requesting a railway station be built as quickly as possible? at the University of Warwick, and will we make sure that the ground can't open until the railway station's opened, unlike the Rico? Councillor Buck, then. In a perfect yes. world, yeah. <laughs> in a word, yes. Um, I was aware of it, and I, kind of, uh, I could see where they were coming from. There was a lot of speculation as to exactly where they're proposing it. But I can see that uh, it's close to where the proposed station is going to be and also a link road. So I can see the reasoning behind why their proposal. But uh, by my way of thinking, uh, there's an awful lot of money needs to be found and uh, a lot of planning permissions, etc., to be put in place. So uh, uh, we will watch this space and we'll be in, robust in our responses to anything that comes our way from the county council point of view. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Do you have a follow-up question, Councillor Kandaka? No, I'm happy no, to have okay. a railway station at the university. Yeah. So I have no other uh, questions then. Thank you very much. We now move on to any items of urgent business, which there are none. So I'd like to declare the end of the council meeting. But fellow councillors, please don't go away. 
because uh, we have some other items to talk about. And the first one is the uh, leader decision making meeting. So, Councillor Seckham. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, closing my cabinet and the membership has been uh, pretty much the same as we forecast. Is he pull your mic down? I've done it again, honestly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, so I. I propose the uh, cabinet that I have uh, suggested, which is in paper marked B. Uh, this is much the same as the uh, arrangements that we have had up to now. And uh, I don't need a seconder. So I just want to say uh, that actually the last year has been a, an excellent um, uh, accolade from my cabinet. I want to thank them all for the hard work that they have put up, put in and for their delivery of the schemes within their own remit. Uh, I believe we are a very close-knit and well-engaged cabinet. Uh, we want always to be responsive to the needs of the whole council and for that I think the working groups, the cabinet working groups on recovery have been a very vital part of that level of engagement and uh, I would like to um, see how that how they have been received and see whether this is something we want to do into the future. But thanks to my cabinet, thanks for the work you have done, and and in particular over the COVID period, I know it's it's taken a lot of extra time. Thank you for that. I move Thank my cabinet. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you very much. We're now moving on to election of uh, chairs and vice chairs to eight committees. And uh, as we start off, I'm going to, uh, as we go along, I'm going to read out the membership of each committee. Uh, and I want those members to be the only ones that are going to vote for their chairman and, and, and uh, their vice chairman. So we start off with the Staff and Pensions Committee. Is that right? or, do, or, or do they actually already have a chair to the staff and pensions? No, no that's no. all. Okay, staff and pensions committee. Right. Uh, so the membership of that. Um, can't find it. Um, oh yeah, audit and standards committee. Yes, I've got uh, Councillor Singh Birdie, Councillor Horner, staff and pensions. Sorry, Councillor Horner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of a mix up. Okay. We'll start again. The Staff and Pensions Committee is Councillor Horner, Councillor Kaur, Councillor Singh Panda, Councillor Stevens, uh, Councillor Dervix, and Councillor Gifford. And uh, I would invite nominations for the chair. Yeah, I'd like to nominate Councillor Kaur. I second that. That's Councillor Horner, right? Are there any other nominations? No. Um, we're going to have a vote on that, I presume. So, yes, all those who uh, uh, approve of that, please put your hands up. I've actually put the, my hand up for myself. <laughs> well, I think that's unanimous, so congratulations, Cam. Cam. So uh, we now move on to the election of vice chair. Thank you, chair. May I nominate Bill Gifford, please, as uh, my vice chair? And I will second him. Okay. Uh, and all those who want to vote for, uh, please say aye. Or put your hands up. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Yep. Okay, yours, Councillor Core, yours to move uh, appointments set out on paper mark C, is that right? That, that is correct, and I move it as let, set out, Chair, if I may. Okay. Do you have a second? Do I have a seconder, John? Are you seconding me here? Thank you. He's got his hand up. Okay, all those uh, who want to vote for that, please do. Okay. Can I, just, can I just remind that only the um, councillors that are in, on this meeting are to be voting? 
not uh, the members of, of, of this panel or, that are attending. So only the members of this panel should be voting at this moment in time. Good, yeah. Okay. Um, right, well, that's carried. So that's that sorted out. Right. We're now going to go on to the Pensions Fund uh, Investment Subcommittee. Uh, that's Councillor Core, Morgan, Redford, Robert Simpson, Vince, Second, Singh Birdy, Singh Panda, Stevens, Timms, Warwick, and P. Williams. There must be some more. That's, that's the Conservatives on it. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, get rid of that one. Okay, so I start again. So, the, the pension, we've got Councillor Dervix, Gifford, Horner, Stevens, and Wallace Redford. And I'd like a election of chair. I'd like a proposer, please. I'm happy to propose Councillor Stevens. Okay. Do you have a second? John, John Horner seconding. Okay. Uh, is everybody in favour of that? Please put your hands up. Yeah. Oh. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's uh, carried. Thank you very much. Congratulations, uh, Bob. Uh, I've got the next vice chair. Um, who could have a nomination, please? I'm prepared to nominate Councillor Gifford. And the seconder. Yeah, I'll second. Uh, okay. All those in favour, put your hands up, please. Yeah, that's carried. Thank you very much. We now go on to the regulatory committee. And uh, I would like to um, ask for the uh, invite nominations for the chair. Yeah, could I uh, propose Councillor Mark Cargill, please? That's Councillor Warwick, yes. Do we have a seconder? I'd like to second that, please. Councillor Jill Simpson Vince. Uh, any other nominations? No, in that case, could you always put your put your hands up, please? Uh, that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Congratulations. Uh, now, election of a vice chair. Thank you, chair. I would like to nominate Councillor Dervix, please. Uh, and a seconder. I'll second that, chair. Thank you. Councillor Phillips, Caroline Phillips. Thank you very much. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. We're now going to go on to the Adult Social Care and Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Uh, the members are Helen Adkins, Joe Bar Barker, Margaret Bell, John Cook, Andy Jens, Keith Kandaka, Wallace Redford, Kate Rolfe, Jerry Roodhouse and Mike Brain. So can I have an election for the chair of that committee, please? Yeah, Chairman, I would like to propose uh, Councillor Wallace Redford. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Do I have a seconder? I would like to second Councillor Wallace Redford. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Uh, are there any other nominations? Can I have a vote, please? Please, those in favour, put your hands up. Thank you very much. That's carried. And uh, so, congratulations, Councillor Redford. Uh, election of Vice Chair. Um, we'd like uh, nominations, please. Well, this isn't here. Oh, someone, else will need someone else will vote. need to vote. Councillor Redford is, 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 is unavailable. Could I have a nominee, please? Somebody to nominate uh, Margaret Bell, please, as Vice Chairman. I'm happy Mike to Brown. nominate. Uh, uh, okay, one of those. <laughs> and the second? Uh, I'll, I'll second that. Andy Jens, thank you very much. Can I have a uh, uh, show, show of hands who's in favour of that? That's pretty unanimous, really. So, congratulations to uh, the seconder. Uh, now we come on to the Children and Young People Overview and Scrutiny Committee. The members of which are Councillor Margaret Bell, Jonathan Childers, Yusuf Starmash, Corrine Davis, Pete Gilbert, Dan Gisane, Howard Roberts, Dominic Skinner, Chris and Pam Williams. Could I have a nomination for the vote of the chair, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, nominate uh, the most avuncular and exceptional chairman, Councillor Dimash. Thank you very much. Do I have a seconder? 
Yeah, I can lip read, Chris. Yes, you're yeah. obviously seconding it. Uh, are there any other nominations? No, can we, all those in favour, put your hands up, please? That's obviously carried, so congratulations, uh, Councillor Darmash. We now need an election of a vice chair. Can I have a, a, a mover, please? Can I propose Councillor Pam Williams, please, the vice chair? You can. Who's the seconder, please? I'll second that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Any other nominations? No, well, in that case, uh, can you all vote by putting your hands up, please? That's uh, unanimous, so congratulations, uh, uh, Pam, that's done. We now go on to the Communities Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Chairman. Yes. Chairman, sorry to interrupt, but I, I lost internet connection, so I don't know whether adult social care has been done or not. Uh, we, we, we've done that. Oh, thank you. And, and even without your presence, you are still elected as chairman, so congratulations. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the, the, the internet just went blank. <laughs> thank you. Never mind. Uh, we're now on Communities Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and for a reminder, the membership of this year is Jenny Fragley, uh, Claire Golby, Ted Brown, John Holland, Andy Jens, Keith Kandaka, Bhagwant Singh Panda, Andy Sargent, Dave Shilton and Andy Wright. Do I have a nomination for the chair of that committee, please? Can I recommend yes, Councillor Chris Grant? I'd, Councillor yes, Shilton? I propose that Claire Goldwyn becomes the chairman of this committee. Thank you very much. Do I have a seconder? I'll second that. Thank you very much. Uh, any other nominations? Chair, can I recommend Councillor Grant? Seb Grant as chair. Okay, uh, who do you have a seconder? Uh, if there's no seconder, I can't take that nomination. So we will vote on um, Councillor Golby. So all those in favour, put your hands up, please. Uh, that is carried. So thank you very much and congratulations, Claire. Uh, we now have an election of vice chair uh, and I'd like to take uh, any, any nomination. Can I nominate Councillor Shilton, please? Do I have a seconder? <coughs> a seconder, please. Andy Wright, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Andy. So could you all please vote and put your hands up, please? Uh, that's carried. Thank you very much indeed and congratulations, Dave. Thank you. We now get to, I think, the last meeting, which is the Resources and Fire and Rescue Overview and Scrutiny. And just as a reminder, the membership is Parminder Singh Birdie, Sarah Bode, John Cook, Judith Phelps, Pete Gilbert, Andy Jens, Maggie O'Rourke, Dave Riley, Adrian Warwick and Alan Webb. Uh, can I have nominations for the chair, please? Chair, Councillor Birdie, um, I would like to propose Adrian Warwick, an excellent chair, um, for the post of the chair this year, please. Thank you. And do I have a seconder? No, I'd like to second that, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Do I have any other nominations? No, well, in that case, uh, can I ask the votes, please, by putting your hands up? Yes, that's obviously carried. And uh, can I congratulate uh, Councillor Warwick for the, being the vote elected as chair? And our election of vice chair for that committee. Can I have a nomination, please? Yes, Chair. Can I nominate Councillor Singverdy, please? You can. Do I have a seconder? Uh, I'd like to second that, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Any other nominations? Uh, in that case, could you go to the vote? All those put your hands up. I'm trying to vote. Uh, well, that's uh, obviously carried, and so uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Parminder Singh Verdi as vice chairman. So I think that's all. Uh, so can I once again thank all councillors and everybody else involved for their patience today. I think it's been um, one or two glitches, but I think on the whole it's been very successful. And we're still on the steep learning curve with this, but it does need everybody's uh, help and patience and i thank you for that so i'd like to declare today's meeting closed no i've got another question
for before members of Park, could I remind you that there will be an additional meeting of staff pensions to be held to consider an exempt report. Only members of staff and pensions need to attend that meeting and a separate Teams invitation has been sent. Thank you, Chair. Hello. Um, hi. It's just kick the answer machine. Well chaired. Phone. Well chaired. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Well you can finish the streaming now. Yeah. Thank well you, all. Monica. Well done, Hi. Chairman. Yeah.